So the next uh, thing, cuts and lacerations. So again, this comes from the St. John's uh, ambulance, uh, the orthodox approach. If the bleeding doesn't stop, if there's a foreign object in the cut, or you think it might be infected, then maybe you should seek healthcare, advice of a healthcare professional. Uh, clean the wound by rinsing it under running water or using alcohol-free wipes. Pat the cut dry using a gauze swab and cover it with a sterile gauze. If you don't have these, use a clean, non-fluffy cloth. Raise and support the part of the body that's injured. If it's a hand or arm, raise it above the head. If it's a lower limb, lay them down and raise the cut area above the level of the heart. This will help to stop the bleeding. Remove the gauze covering the wound and apply a sterile dressing. And if you think there's a risk of infection, again, suggest they see a healthcare professional. So we're going to look at our main remedy for helping to heal cuts and lacerations. And this is calendula. Calendula is a marigold, very pretty, bright orange plant that slugs love. Uh, but calendula, we use calendula both internally and externally. Quite often it's used externally as a tincture to pour onto cuts or wounds to help to heal them. You can dilute it and apply it to sore skin, uh, any, any wounds, but also you can give it internally uh, to help uh, recovery of any and prevent infection. Uh, so it heals wounds very, very quickly. Uh, and one of our one, some of our experience with, uh, with calendula in fairly traumatic situations comes from a very famous doctor called Dr. Petrie Hoyle. And uh, in World War I, Dr. Hoyle was a field surgeon. And he was a field surgeon when they didn't have everything they needed. They couldn't get the drugs they needed. They couldn't always get the dressings they needed. What he did have was a huge supply of calendula. Uh, and he used the, the calendula solutions to clean wounds and to apply wet dressings. And the, the results were really uniformly good. Uh, here's an account of the type of wounds that they were, were dealing with. And many of them were, were compromised by... Uh, exposure to horse manure. It says most of the men are absolutely riddled by bomb explosions, shell and shrapnel. Bullets are quite common protruding from all parts of their anatomy from brain to toe. Legs are broken, lungs are crushed, brain and skull all smashed, bullets in the intestines, others going through every place in their bodies. It's a remarkable fact that in those four years, Dr. Hoyle did not see a single new case of tetanus or gangrene develop under homeopathic care, despite the direst conditions of the soldiers with septic wounds. To quote Dr. Petrie Hoyle, I have used this calendula on all sorts of wounds here on the front, pouring it into compound fractures, using it on blackened wounds as many men arrived here from the front with their wounds not dressed for four days, hence the torn flesh was in some instances black and offensive. But to calendula alone, I attribute the quick sweetening of all of these wounds. So we're not talking about just for little cuts here. Uh, that's very impressive documentation from Dr. Uh, Petrie Hoyle many years ago in the most abject of circumstances of preventing gangrene uh, and helping uh, people with the uh, terrible wounds to survive. So it heals wounds quickly. We need to make sure that our wounds are really clean before we start to apply calendula because it will start to knit the skin together quickly. So cleaning wounds and then uh, giving calendula and we can give it internally in a tablet form in a 30C or we can apply it as a, a tincture. Sometimes the tincture comes in a form called hypercal tincture, which is combined with another uh, herb called hypericum, St. John's wort. Uh, uh, and that's very often found in, in good first aid kits. And it's a little of that diluted in some water is a fantastic solution for helping to apply to wounds, grazes, uh, any skin wounds really and it, it helps uh, prevent infection and again very useful post-surgery we can use it internally or externally uh, as a compress onto onto a wound to help to, to speed up the healing 
and again like arnica we can use it uh, after dental extraction and we can dilute it and use it as a mouthwash uh, not to be done too quickly because you don't want to disturb the clot that forms but after 24 hours uh, not too uh, forceful solution but a gentle uh, mouthwash of calendula can help to really speed up uh, the healing of the of the socket. It also heals ruptured eardrums when people have had uh, ear infections and their eardrums have ruptured. Uh, calendula can sometimes uh, help the eardrum to heal and it also can be used in eye baths to help soothe the eyes after injury uh, or something having gotten in the eye. Uh, it helps to heal ulcerations of the skin. Uh, it's also not just for the skin, you know, it's the number, of, not an awful lot of people know this and not even all the homeopaths are quite aware of how useful calendula is for torn muscle. When people tear their muscle as opposed to just pull, strain, stretch, traumatize their muscle, if they actually tear a muscle, snap it, um, sometimes it needs surgery Sometimes calendula, if it's a small attachment, calendula will heal it. But even if it's needed surgery, calendula will really help to make sure that the, the injury heals really well. You can use it topically to soothe burns once they're cooled. We'll be doing burns as a separate, a separate section. Uh, so it's a very useful remedy, but specifically a, a remedy for the helping when we've got uh, cuts, wounds, lacerations, operations, for speeding up the, the healing of the skin, helping the tissues to knit together, preventing infection, and just encouraging healthy granulation in a wound. It's, it's brilliant. And when the symptoms agree, uh, calendula can be used also for stomach ulcers. Hypericum is our next remedy. Hypericum is a remedy which is sometimes known as the arnica of the nerves. So we're going to use this for injuries to areas that are very rich in nerve tissue. So it's typical that somebody will maybe shut their fingers in the door. So painful. When you, when you injure that part, because your, our fingers are incredibly sensitive, not only because of the, uh, how, how dexterous we need to be with our hands, but also because we tell whether things are hot or cold or soft or rough. So we have lots and lots of nerve endings of different types in our hands. And when we squish a part rich in nerves, it's extraordinarily painful. So we can use this when somebody has crushed their fingers in a door or bashed their finger with a hammer and... Oh, and actually, it's quite amazing how quickly it can take away some of the pain. Uh, or they may have had a sort of crush injury where there is numbness of the affected part. And it's going to take a little bit of time to heal a bad crush injury. But hypericum will start to make sure that the nerve tissue regenerates and that it heals and that the trauma starts to disappear. You might, in these situations, want to alternate arnica and hypericum for a crush injury.
where there's been bruising and swelling as well as damage to a part very rich in nerves. Also our spine and our neck are parts that are very rich in nerves. So if somebody has been in a car accident and they've hurt their neck or their neck doesn't feel good afterwards, again we can give them arnica but we could alternate it with hypericum. So again here we're seeing some of the situations where we may not just choose one single remedy because there are sometimes two very specific things going on at the same time. There's a trauma and a bruise but there's also an injury to a part rich in nerves. So my view is it does no harm to alternate the two. You could take Arnica at 10, Hypericum at 12, Arnica at 2, Hypericum at 4 and just alternate that way throughout the day until things start to improve. Oh, taps are running somewhere I think. So we can use it when anyone has a head injury, a neck injury, a spinal injury. I'm not suggesting that we start to treat spinal injuries ourselves. Obviously, people with these serious type of injuries uh, will need expert attention. But as people are healing, because there's no contraindication with remedies and orthodox remedies, we can sometimes help their uh, speed up their healing uh, by administering homeopathic remedies at that time. So, uh, shooting pains and numb tingling pains are often the, the pains that we feel when a, one of our nerves has been compromised. Sharp shooting, enough that you go, ow, you would shout out, it's a real sharp, intense pain. Nerve pain's very intense. And if it isn't sharp and intense, then usually it's numb and tingling and, and just weird feeling, as if you've not got the right sensation in the affected part. Uh, after childbirth, Hypericum can help with the after effects of an episiotomy or an epidural. Now, epidurals are, uh, they're not only given in, um, in Libra. Sometimes people who are having hip replacements have epidurals, uh, but they're an injection right into the spinal, uh, intervertebral sp through the intervertebral space into the spinal column uh, to numb the nerves. Uh, but sometimes people don't feel good after a, an epidural. They have a headache or they have backache. Uh, and sometimes we can use hypericum for somebody who says, I'm not actually, that is my etiology. I had an epidural and this happened and I've never been well since that epidural. Uh, it's routinely given after dental treatment but particularly root canal work where the nerves are extracted and where there's some sort of real deep work going on and where you're working very near to the facial nerves as well. So sometimes in dental work where or, or, or extractions where the doctors say the, the, the root of your tooth is very running very close to your facial nerve and I'm slightly concerned we can make sure that we have a hypericum standing by to make sure that uh, any inflammation of that nerve is, is quickly dealt with. It's used as a treatment for uh, tetanus, as a, a, a prevention. Uh, we use two remedies, we use hypericum and we use ledum. Sometimes we, you know, sometimes homeopaths go and work in parts of the world where um, the population don't have uh, access to orthodox medical care. And so we never know when we're going to, to need uh, to use it in these situations. We're probably unlikely to need it in these situations working in the UK. But, you know, homeopaths end up all over the world and it's useful to know these things. And it can be useful after uh, animal bites or stings if they're very painful. It can also be very useful in shingles when people have... Uh, pain along the course of a nerve uh, which in shingles can be very very uncomfortable so we can we can give hypericum for these situations and when the symptoms agree hypericum can also be very useful trigeminal neuralgic pain and also sometimes for hemorrhoids
broken bones. So the orthodox approach to broken bones. Uh, the main things to look out for are swelling, difficulty of moving, or moving in an unnatural way, a limb that looks shorter, twisted or bent, a grating noise or feeling, loss of strength and shock. What you need to do, if it's an open fracture, cover the wound with a sterile dressing, secure it with a bandage, apply pressure to control the bleeding, support the injured part and try as best as possible to prevent it from moving and that should help to ease the pain and prevent any any further damage. Um, once the patient is stable or if there's two of you immediately call 999 uh, or um, 11, is it 112 is it in America? Yeah, wherever you live, call, call, call the emergency services um, and try not to move the patient at all unless they're in immediate danger. Uh, you can, whilst you're waiting for medical help to arrive, protect the injured area by using bandages to secure it to an uninjured part of the body so that you can, uh, broken fingers, you can bandage them to a non-broken finger, uh, a kind of slight splinting of it, just to keep it m more... Um, stable and less mobile and fractures on the arm can be secured with a sling and the leg might be bound to the uninjured leg to, to keep it stable. Our main remedy for helping to heal broken bones is symphytum. Symphytum is for any injury to bone. Again this comes from the Greek, Greek sympho to unite and it is a great remedy for broken bones. It's really the only remedy you need to know for broken bones. This, like calendula, can heal the skin quickly. This can set a bone quickly. So make sure that the bone is in its proper place before you give the symphytum to the patient. Make sure that they've been to the hospital, that their bone is set. You don't give it to them at the site of the accident. If, you're, if it's somebody you know and they're happy to receive remedies, you can give them arnica then. But don't give them the symphytum until they've been to hospital and their bone has been set in the appropriate position. Then you would give the symphytum because it really speeds up the healing process. The pain, there may be a lot of pain in the bone and there may be particularly pricking pains in the bones. It's useful for pain in a stump after amputation. We can use hypericum for this too. When some people have had to have a, a, a leg amputated and they get horrible phantom pains, which are very distressing, um, remedies like symphytum and hypericum can be amazing at soothing and getting rid of those very unpleasant phantom pains. We can use symphytum when somebody has a very difficult type of fracture that resists healing. Uh, maybe a spiral fracture of the tibia, which are very complex fractures and may be difficult to heal. Sometimes giving symphytum just really, really helps when a bone doesn't want to knit, when, when it's not mending and doctors are concerned, sometimes we can give symphytum and it's, uh, it's quite, quite amazing. Give a low dose? 30 would be fine, maybe daily for a, for, for a time. I, again, when I was quite a young homeopath, I had experience of this with an acquaintance who had been sledging in the winter, had gone down a, a hill, which locally they called Breakneck Pass. <laughs> he'd gone down this on a, on a toboggan and he'd gone out of control and he'd hit a tree and he had a spiral fracture of his tibia and it wasn't healing and he kept going back to the hospital and they were concerned. I had, I knew, only knew him briefly, you know, acquaint, acquaint, he wasn't a friend, he was an acquaintance. And I said, homeopathy can help if it's not healing, you know, we may be able to do something that'll help. And he said, no, you're all right, I'm fine, I'm at the specialist under the, you know, he's fine. So he kept going back and it was only when the, when the, the surgeon said, you know, this can't be pinned, but if this doesn't heal, uh, we may be looking at an amputation. He was round up knocking on my door as faster than you can say knife. And he said, you know, you said there might be something I could do. And I said, yes. He said, can I try it? And I said, sure. 
I said it's just a simple remedy, it's called Symphytum. There may be other remedies, but this is the main one for healing bones that are struggling to unite. Um, take it, uh, take it every day between now and when you go back to see um, your specialist again. He went back to the specialist and he had an x-ray and the specialist said, I don't understand this. He said, it's almost like you've grown a bandage of bone around your tibia. I've never seen this in my life. And he said, well, I'm using Symphytum. It's a homeopathic remedy. And this guy just poo-pooed it. It's extraordinary to me that, that, that they should do that. Anyway, this guy, while he was at waiting in the doctor's waiting room every time he had to go, he met another guy there a couple of times. And this guy was in for the same injury, but he had been in a motorbike accident. And in the motorbike accident, he had been left with a spiral fracture of his tibia that wouldn't heal. And he said, you know, I went to see uh, this person and they gave me this remedy. I, I, you know, maybe you should try it. So the next week, this guy with the motorbike, he said, I spoke to uh, somebody that you know uh, called Steve that I met at the fracture clinic. And he said you'd give them this. I said, yes, would you like some? I gave him some, some vitamin. He came back and he said the doctor was amazed. He said... Ah, I've seen this before. And he said, was it my mate Steve? <laughs> he said it was. He said he was using this as well, wasn't he, these little pills? And the doc, do you know, for a man who spends all his life dealing with fractures and possibly with people who are going to need amputations, young men, you'd think he might just say, what is that stuff? Can I have, you know, could I find out about it, do a little bit of research, maybe even try it on some of my patients who are in a similar situation, but no, nothing. Anyway, that was my early experience with Symphytum, that even in extraordinary fractures, that it can really help. Obviously, nothing fits everybody. There are some situations where it isn't going to work, but it, there's a pretty good chance of it working and it's not going to do any harm, so again, why not try it? Aside from the non-union of fractures, it can be useful for injuries to the eye from blunt force trauma, maybe a tennis ball in the eye. And again, you can alternate it with arnica. But also injuries to the bony part of the eye because injuries to the bone anywhere, whether it's the skull or the facial bones, the maxilla or the orbit, injury to bones anywhere, we can use a little bit of symphytum to try and uh, ease the swelling and pain in the bone, uh, help when there's injuries to the bones and also where there's any breakage or fracture. It's a, it's a marvellous remedy. Uh, our last section in this particular section, I think, is strains and sprains. When we uh, step off a stair badly and we go right over on our ankle or fall down a curb or any injuries that mean that we fall and move one of our, our joints, very often the wrists and the ankles in a position that really strains and pulls our tendons and they hurt, they swell, we may be uh, unable to wait there for a while and they can take quite a long time to, to heal. So once again the orthodox approach, uh, they say remember rice for the four steps to deal with strains and sprains. Rest, help them to sit or lie down and support them in a comfortable position and raise the part that they've hurt. Ice to cool the area, uh, apply a cold compress uh, like an ice pack or a cold pad and this will help to reduce uh, the swelling, the bruising and the pain. 
Uh, don't leave the ice pack on as we said before. Five minutes on and off is quite good, making sure it's wrapped in a towel so that you don't injure the tissues by freezing. Uh, the C is the comfortable support uh, uh, and leaving the compress in place, give it a good layer of padding uh, around the area and tie a supporting bandage around it. That's that one, that's the comfortable support. So we've got, uh, sorry, we've got rest and ice, we've got comfortable support, which we've already said, and elevation. Uh, elevate the injury, support it with something soft like cushions, and if you're worried, if they really can't walk at all, send them just in case they have fractured it, it to the hospital. They, sometimes a really bad strain isn't a really bad strain, it's a fracture. Uh, but you can get different types of fracture. So if it's really severe and somebody really can't walk at all or wait there, that might be worth doing. But mostly we know when we've really sprained or, or injured a, 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 a part of our body in that way. And these are the remedies that will help us to deal with it. The first one is Rustox. Rustox is a fantastic remedy because we're going to find out as we go through some of these remedies today that we have remedies that are very specific. Arnica is very specific for bruises. It doesn't have that many other aspects, it does have a few. But Rustox has so many things that it's useful for, you'll see that it's going to crop up as previous useful remedy alert on a few of the, th the situations we're going to talk about. It's a very, it has a very broad use. But the biggest thing that we're going to use it for, the, the, the most frequent thing I should say, is for strains and sprains. And again, here, the, the symptoms that we're going to see, whatever the problem is with rust tox, we're going to see some of these uh, symptoms that I've put in black type. So we're going to see stiffness. Whatever we're treating a person for, uh, if they need the remedy rust tox, we're going to expect to see stiffness. It's a very primary symptom, and the pains are felt when they first begin to move. And it's better when the patient has limbered up so better for continued motion. So somebody who's in a rust tox state, who's maybe injured themselves, when they first get out of a chair, oh, it's really hard to move, they're really stiff, they're walking like a duck or something, they can't move. But as they continue walking and, and they limber up, they feel freer and it feels better. But if they do too much, they'll seize up again. So there's a, a, there's a, a particular point in time that is good, not immediately after they've started to move. It hurts when they first move, but when they get going it feels better, but they mustn't do too much or it will get worse again. So pains are felt when first beginning to move and the pain and stiffness is better when the patient has limbered up and continued the motion. Also the pain is always worse uh, for coldness and better for heat. They like warm applications, it makes them... We always ask that. The orthodox approach and sometimes naturopathic approach is often to put ice and cold on an injury. As homeopaths, we ask a patient, what do you feel you would like to have uh, on your injury, you know, on your stiff shoulder? Would you like an ice pack or would you like a warm pack? If they say warm pack, it's more often uh, a rust tox complaint. Uh, warmth eases them, it makes it feel like they, the, the joint can become less stiff and more limber, as if it's kind of um, defrosting it. It's also a very good remedy for repetitive strain injury, overuse of any part. So for people who have tennis elbow, who have drummer's ankle, who have mouse finger, whatever it is that they have, uh, any repetitive strain injury, we can consider some rust tox for them. And if you remember when we talked about the person with the throat who'd been singing and who had uh, rehearsed for two days and then sang, uh, and we said rust tox, because the over exertion of a part can also apply to the voice. So it could be overuse of tendons and, and a particular part, or it could be overuse of the voice. The pains are tearing and shooting and sometimes raw. They're very restless and they find it very hard to be, to be comfortable. They're worse for coldness and dampness. And they may have back pain and strain from lifting. 
it's a great remedy you know when the symptoms agree it might also be useful we've mentioned sore throat and we're going to come back to that flu arthritis typically if somebody had arthritis and they needed this remedy those things would be there they would be finding it very difficult to get out of a chair but they would feel a bit better for a gentle walk when it's warm and they'd always be worse when it's cold when it's damp and when they've been sitting too long you say if i drive and i get out of the car after i've been sat in the car for a while i'm oh it's really hard but once i get walking about the town i'm okay very very specific for rust tox uh, so very stiff better continued motion better for warmth and warm applications and worse for cold applications and for backache when you've strained your back from overlifting and again you've got that stiffness on first moving and on lying down in bed at night when you're not moving uh, and the back is very sore so it's a great remedy for strains and sprains and overuse of muscle and muscle tissues and a remedy that's very very similar to rust tox and again we sometimes use it in combination uh, you can use in in strains and sprains you can use arnica rust tox and also this remedy, Ruta Grava. A Ruta Gravio lens is its full name. Rue is the plant. This is for damage to the ligaments and tendons, but it's also for damage to the lining of the bone, the periosteum of the bone. But it's an excellent remedy for torn and wrenched tendons. And again, it's stiff and inflexible. And it's used often with or after rust tox for very similar issues. There seems to be a loss of elasticity in the tendons. They become tight and short. It's a specifically useful remedy for carpal tunnel syndrome. And again, RSI from typists, musicians, computer programmers, people who use... I've used it also for people who play violin uh, and they're using their wrists a, a lot. Uh, so any overexertion of the wrists we can consider uh, Ruta Grava. It's also useful for eye strain. Years ago, you know, like maybe in the, I don't know, 14th century or something, we used to get the Bibles used to be written by monks and they used to be illuminated, they used to call them illuminated. Um, they had these fantastic uh, books of light with these wonderful uh, pictures in them. And the monks often worked long hours in devotion doing these illuminated pictures by candlelight. And they often grew uh, rue in the monasteries where they would make compresses and put it on their eyes because they got such a lot of eye strain from working in adverse conditions. So anybody who's really strained their eyes from over-reading in, in, in dull light or have been working for days on something and they just think, oh God, my eyes have really strained them. Uh, Ruta is the, is the remedy for, for overuse of the eye muscles. It's also good for bursitis in a joint where the, the, the capsule of the fluid around a joint uh, leaks and you get a lot of swelling and pain. Uh, we call that housemaid's knee uh, when, we, when it happens in the knee, but we can get it in the elbow for leaning hard on the, on the elbow. And also for policeman's heel, which is sometimes known as uh, palantar fasciitis. Pain in the heel and in the tendons that run under the surface of the foot. And a bit like uh, rust tox, they're worse in cold, wet weather and worse by overexertion and better from gentle movement and warmth. So rust tox and ruta are two remedies that go very much hand in hand. If you had a bad sprain, uh, you could get a bottle of water, you could pop one rust tox in and one ruta grava in, give it a good shake and sip it throughout the day. A nice easy way to combine your remedies. You can do that with the arnica too if you want, depending on the severity of the injury or the bruising. You can pop an arnica, a rust tox and a ruta. A very classical homeopath will raise their hands in horror. No, find out which one it is and use that one remedy. And you can do that if you like. Uh, certainly the, if you can see very clearly that one remedy is the, is, the, is the remedy you need, then that's great. But if you're not sure or if it's a complicated injury, 
and you can see that more than one part has been injured. I do this. I give people a, a, a bottle of water with an arnica, a rust toxin, a root in it and just say sip that throughout the day uh, and do the same again tomorrow and until the injury starts to heal. Yes, good for ganglion cysts. Most of the ganglion cysts are caused by trauma and overuse of a tendon. They often happen on the back of the hand. They are a very hard swelling on a tendon. They feel hard like bone, but they are actually just a cyst on the tendon. Old-fashioned remedies used to be hit it with a heavy book. <laughs> I think that's a bit brutal myself. I'd much rather take some ruta. Uh, and sometimes you get them on the dorsal surface of the foot as well. And they can be painful, They're not always painful, but they can be. Uh, but sometimes a low dose of ruta over quite a long period of time will, will shift a, 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 ganglion, uh, a, a ganglion swelling. So we're going to move on now after traumas to uh, remedies for fevers and again to start uh, off with we're going to look at the orthodox approach. The orthodox approach to a fever is help make the patient comfortable, keep them cool, ideally in bed with a sheet or a very light covering, give them plenty of cool drinks to replace any fluid they might be losing from sweating. If they're feeling unwell, you can give them the recommended dose of paracetamol. Check their breathing pulse and levels of response until they're feeling better. If you're worried about their condition, call their local doctor surgery or their NHS advice line if you're in the UK. If the temperature is above 39.C, call the doctor. Again, uh, wherever you are, seek medical help. And if they're worse, uh, you could even call an ambulance. That's the orthodox approach. Our approach would be slightly different, but not completely different. The nice thing is that when you get uh, the right remedy for a fever, they will come down really quickly. The higher the fever, the quicker it will respond to remedies. What we would say is we wouldn't use paracetamol unless the fever really was significantly high. Um, just moving back there, um, they say, oh yes, don't give the aspirin-based medication uh, to, to children, but you can give paracetamol or calpol is what's usually given to children. Well, you can do if that's what you would like to do, but if you want to try and avoid calpol 
and there's more and more recent research about overdoing Calpol for children and may actually have implications, one of them being asthma later in life. So if you want to minimize the need for Calpol, using remedies at the first sign of a fever is usually going to be uh, really effective. Uh, some of that advice perfect keep the child cool yes not cold applications but cool applications you know sort of a tepid they say tepid sponging not cold water which may restrict the pores and actually raise the inner temperature but tepid sponging keeping them cool giving them plenty of drinks to drink but if a temperature is above say um, uh, I talk in old school 102 which is about 37.38 um, then I might uh, give Calpol but the whole time it's under that I'm very happy to try remedies and keep the child cool um, and very quickly the right remedy will bring the temperature down uh, however always be guided by your instincts and if the child looks listless non-responsive then don't hesitate to seek medical help. The remedy we're going to talk about first is belladonna. Belladonna is a very well-known remedy uh, homeopathically. Uh, it's a big remedy for children and it comes of course from deadly nightshade uh, rendered safe and effective by the homeopathic uh, process of dilution and succussion. When somebody has uh, belladonna symptoms Again, all the things that are in black type are the things that you need to remember about belladonna. If they have a fever that requires belladonna, usually the fever will come on suddenly. They seemed fine a minute ago and now all of a sudden they look really pink and they are becoming hot. <coughs> so they'll be hot to the touch. You might put your hand to their forehead and you think, oh blimey, they're burning up. Um, they, they will have significantly high temperature. The cheeks will be very hot and red. You'll see it in them. You'll think, gosh, they really are burning up. They look hot, they look red, they're hot to the touch and their temperature is high. Uh, they may have a little moan at every breath. When children are unwell, I've noticed this when children come in to see me and they're unwell and they require belladonna. And they might be sat on their mum's lap and they're feeling very sorry for themselves. And they're going, uh, uh, uh like that, like a little moaning sound at, at every breath that they take. In temperature, their eyes will be sparkly, like slightly glassy looking as the pupils will be a little bit dilated. If they're old enough to describe their pains to you, they may describe their pains as throbbing. That means like synchronous with the heartbeat, boom, <coughs> boom, boom. And there may, if their temperature is high, when they're relaxing or falling asleep, they may twitch or jerk uh, as they fall asleep. When, uh, when my kids were really little and they're all grown up now and my eldest daughter's actually studying homeopathy now, um, but that eldest daughter, as a baby, she was prone to throwing fevers. And I remember one night she was probably three or four and uh, she had fallen asleep. She'd ha she didn't know how she had gone out of the stage where she would have an afternoon sleep, but she we'd had a busy day. We got home. She'd seemed fine. She fell asleep on the sofa, which was slightly unusual. And I thought, you know, I'll let her have half an hour, then I'm going to waken her and give her a bath because otherwise she won't sleep tonight. The things that we, we tell ourselves. <laughs> so I went to waken her and I noticed that she was really flushed. I thought, oh gosh, she's really, she's really flushed. I thought she might just be rosy from sleep because the room was quite warm. And I woke her up and said, Em, give her a little shake. And she looked at me. And as soon as she opened her eyes, I thought, uh oh, I'm in trouble here. And she looked at me and she looked wild. And she got up off the, the sofa and she ran away from me and she was screaming. And I thought, she's delirious. She, she had got such a high fever. Suddenly, I mean, she was fine when she lay down on the sofa. Well, she's got such a high fever that she's gone into delirium and she's seeing me as some sort of monster. I hope that's not how she usually saw me. So I thought, I need to get the, 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 the belladonna. So I went and got the belladonna and she was hiding behind the sofa from me and she was little and I couldn't get by and so I wanted to pull the sofa out and kind of trap her in there, you know, get her corralled in, in behind the sofa. 
and she really didn't want me to come anywhere near her and I had to almost sit on her and just throw a belladonna into her mouth and as I threw the belladonna into her mouth she just looked at me and she said what game is this we're playing mummy? <laughs> It was so quick, so quick to come on and so quick for the, for the delirium state to, to clear with the belladonna. And I gave her several doses of belladonna over that evening and I slept with her in my bed that night to keep an eye on her. But she was absolutely fine. But I'll never forget that, the delirium and the terror that she had in, in her eyes uh, in this, in this uh, state. So children with fever that require belladonna may become delirious, may wake up in the night. They may have seemed fine when you put them to bed, but they wake up in the night and they're rosy and their eyes are kind of sparkly but frightened looking uh, and they may uh, be feverish and delirious. And belladonna is one of the excellent remedies uh, to bring down their fever and uh, settle them nicely. If they have a pain, the pain will be worse for jarring movement. So that if they had a headache, jarring means if I walk along the floor when I put my foot down, it's kind of jarring. If I had a, if I had a roller skate on, it wouldn't. And when I sit on a chair and I sit, that, it's a jarring, it's a boing kind of thing. So movement that involves footfall or sitting heavily, those are sort of jarring movements. And they're going to aggravate most belladonnas if they, if they have pain. And although they're very hot and their face is going to be very rosy and their eyes are going to be sparkly, um, they may have cold hands and feet. They may, their hands may actually really feel cold or their feet may really feel cold. In the books they say, desire for lemonade. But those books were written at the end of the last century when lemonade was quite a different beast to the lemonade we drink now. Lemonade back then was lemons covered with water and a little bit of sugar. So there was some sweetness to it, but it was pretty tart sort of drink. So often nowadays you might see they want something more sa sour, like an orange juice or something. Uh, and four o'clock may be a time, and when I think about it, that's probably exactly the time that I'm talking about when my daughter fell asleep on the sofa, it was probably around four o'clock. Uh, but it's a wonderful remedy for fever. And we're going to see that we're going to do some recaps on it for some different situations uh, as we go through the day because it's useful for a number of, of features. Uh, when the symptoms agree, belladonna can be used for sore throats, headaches, mastitis, boils and sunstroke. It's one of our big remedies for complaints from overheating and sunstroke. I remember my other daughter, my youngest daughter, we were on holiday and I thought I had managed to keep her out of the sun pretty much, but obviously I hadn't kept her out enough. It's hard when you've got four kids and they want to run around and play. We say, well, you can only go in the water if you put on a t-shirt and a hat, but it's kind of quite difficult. I thought I'd done a pretty good job, but she woke up in the middle of the night and she was in a typical belladonna, very high color, some of it from sun, but her eyes were kind of glassy and she looked afraid and she said, I can hear a wolf and I realized that she was uh, delirious and so I went to get some belladonna and a cup of water and I put the belladonna in the cup of water and I gave her the cup and she went to drink out of the cup and she made a face and she said, the cup's making faces at me, mummy. <laughs> She's definitely delirious. Uh, and I went to get her a spoon and then she vomited. And I, I thought she definitely she's had too much sun. She's a little bit delirious. So I kind of uh, took all her clothes off, kept her really cool. I gave the belladonna, because she didn't want to drink from the cup because the cup was making faces at her, uh, I just kept spooning liquid into her mouth constantly from it. And about an hour and a half she fell asleep and in the morning she was absolutely fine. So it's a great remedy for fever, uh, but also from overdoing uh, the heat or, or sunshine. You have to keep the patient very, very cool uh, and make sure you can get as much fluid into them as possible and give them regular belladonna until they feel better. Chamomilla. Another of our uh, excellent uh, fever remedies and another excellent remedy for children. The fever of chamomilla 
will often accompany teething. It's our biggest remedy for teething. And you may in particular see one cheek red, not like the belladonna, both cheeks burning red, but one cheek red and the other cheek quite pale. They may be a little bit sweaty on their head and very specifically they want to be carried and rocked. Uh, if you've had babies you will know this state where you're quite exhausted from walking up and down to try and keep them calm and quiet and you think oh they're falling asleep and I'm really exhausted I'm just going to sit down with them you're still holding them and you're still kind of slightly shaking them but that's not enough they know the minute you've sat down and they'll wake up and they'll cry again so you have to get up and walk around so it's not just being held they want although they do want that they actively want to be carried from A to B so you have to walk up and down with them and take it in turns pass the baby walk up and down with her for a couple of hours now it's your turn now until eventually they do drop off into a sleep uh, if you have a new baby, you will be so grateful for this remedy over the first couple of years of life. Uh, I had a patient yesterday, a lovely girl who I've been treating for a long time, and she's just had her first baby, brought her baby in to see me. Gorgeous little baby. And uh, he was absolutely fine, no problems whatsoever. And I said to her, I'm just going to give you some uh, chamomilla uh, to take with you. And she said, what's that for? I said, well, when he starts teething, you might need it. If he has colic, you might need it. But basically, any time these symptoms fit, and these symptoms are this, they're irritable, they're maybe a bit pink on one side of the cheek, they want to be carried all the time and they will not let you put them down. And this one down the bottom, capricious, mainly applies to a slightly older child but it means they don't really know what they want they're crying and you say what is it you want they say, i want a biscuit i want a biscuit you get them a biscuit and you give them the biscuit and the biscuits lobbed across the room i don't want a biscuit i don't want a biscuit i want something else and you get them something else and that's equally not suitable so they they want something then they don't want it anymore they're kind of beside themselves they don't know what they want they're miserable they're possibly in a bit of pain or discomfort and they're really cranky and we've all I'm sure if we've had children we've seen our children in that state and if we've known about it and given chamomilla hallelujah and so I said to her it's a remedy you really need to get to know while your while your children are small and I suggested to her that she get some first aid remedies then so that you know when you have children sometimes I said you can text me and say help this is what they've got, what can I do? And if you've got a good selection of first aid remedies at home, I can say, get belladonna, get chamomilla. So I said, but this one, really, when you have little babies, it's an absolute lifesaver. Because it's the worst thing in the world, especially as a new mum, to have a baby that you can't console. A lot of people say, I feel such a terrible mother, I can't get, you know, I've tried feeding them, I've changed them, I've burped them, oh, but they won't stop crying. Yeah, babies are like that sometimes. And sometimes a little dose of chamomilla, oh, it's so soothing. Chamomilla, chamomile is soothing anyway, isn't it? You know, chamomile tea is very soothing to the spirits when we're a bit tense or stressed. Have a nice chamomile tea and everything looks better. It's a very soothing remedy, but particularly soothing for babies. But also, fever, great fever remedy. So remember, hot, maybe slightly sweaty, red on one cheek, maybe accompanying teething and they'll be irritable and really don't know kind of what it is they want not so much in a baby obviously but in an older chamomilla patient they may get headaches and aggravations from drinking coffee it may be useful for earache in children especially when they're teething and when they're red on one side of their face or one ear is bright red with belladonna you'd expect both ears to be bright red Oh, in chamomilla, you'll expect one ear to be bright red. There can be teething pain in babies, but also uh, in teenagers. I sometimes see teenagers need chamomilla for their wisdom teeth, and they're coming through, and they get cranky and get a lot of discomfort. And sometimes just toothache in adults. And when the symptoms agree, uh, chamomilla can be useful for colic in little babies. Again, you get the cranky, don't want to be put down, don't know what's wrong with them. And when they have a poo, it looks like chopped spinach or as if they've been eating grass. 
It's also useful for women for dysmenorrhea where they have really strong period pains and it's also useful in labour, sometimes for labour pains when you feel really, really irritable. But fever, wonderful fever, fever remedy. The third fever remedy we're going to talk about is aconite. Aconite's uh, common name is monk's hood because the flower shape looks a little bit like a monk with his hood up uh, and it's a very very poisonous plant in its raw state and people are often advised if they have children not to grow it in their gardens. Although it's spectacularly beautiful it is very toxic. Of course homeopathically again rendered completely safe uh, but incredibly effective for fevers. With aconite we have this sudden onset bit like belladonna, comes on quickly with very little warning. A keynote of aconite is that they're very anxious, they're very fretful and very fearful and sometimes if they feel unwell their fear is that they're going to die. They feel anxious, they feel restless, they often have a very dry heat with the fever. They may have their heart racing with the fever. If they have a cold, generally it may be worse after exposure to cold wind or getting chilled in general. They may have an etiology of a fright or a severe nightmare or the etiology may be the chill. They tend to be thirsty for cold drinks it's a remedy that's often useful for the early onset of any acute problem, whether it be colds or fevers, but especially colds. And it's one of our main remedies for croup. Dry, croupy coughs, seal barking coughs. Often children get this, you know, when we go back you'll often see that the keynote for getting croup is cold wind. Cold wind in the autumn is a typical croupy season and they get chilled and they may, you may think, oh they've got a little bit of a temperature before they go to bed or they may have been a little bit anxious or grouchy and then they wake up and they have this cough like a seal barking. It is a oh kind of noise, it's a laryngeal cough. One of the things people say to do is to boil a kettle and put something that gives steam into the room uh, and that sometimes does help. But aconite is just the most phenomenally useful remedy for croup. It rarely do you need another remedy. There are a couple of other good croup remedies, but aconite would always be the first one to reach for. So for children who have fevers, for children who have the first sign of a, a cold, especially when the weather's really cold, uh, and uh, children who have really croupy coughs, we're going to revisit uh, aconite a few times uh, over the course of the day and the last subject we're going to be doing today is emotional acutes and we're going to be revisiting aconite for panic attacks uh, because when the symptoms agree aconite may be useful for influenza, panic attacks and retention of urine. These are our top three uh, throat remedies and uh, so our top three f uh, fever remedies and in fact you can buy sometimes uh, a remedy called ABC children's ABC for fevers and it's actually a combination of aconite, chamomilla and belladonna and if in doubt if you don't feel confident enough to uh, decide between the three you can either do what we suggested, which is pop an aconite, a belladonna and chamomilla in some water, stir it and give a spoonful of that. However, what we are trying to do is learn a little bit about how to practice homeopathy and how to apply homeopathy. And you can see from what we've been saying that although those are our top three fever remedies for children, there are others, that actually you may be able to tell them apart. The belladonna is going to be bright red, all red, with the glassy eyes and the very high temperature. The chamomilla is going to be the cranky kid with the one red 
side of the face and just want to be carried and is a little bit more inconsolable. So if we take that good clams, if we take a good bit of information, we may not need to reach for the combination remedy or to mix the combination ourselves. We may able to be able to say, I think it's belladonna. They're hot, they're red, they've got very high temperature and glassy eyes. I'm going to try the belladonna. And you might find that after a few doses, you think, yep, this has hit the spot. Brilliant. And you learn something from that in your acute prescribing. And if it doesn't work and it isn't bringing the temperature down, you also can, after a few doses, if you don't think anything's happening, then you can think, ah, I was trying to decide between the belladonna and the aconite and the belladonna hasn't worked, so now I'm going to try the aconite. So you can either combine them if you like, but if you can find the one remedy, that's always better. And again, remember, you can move on to a different remedy if the well-selected remedy hasn't done what you want it to do. It does say in the material medical retention of urine in children. Yeah, sometimes when children have very high fevers, they stop weeing. Right. And it's something that they say, if your baby has a very high temperature, you need to check that their nappies are wet. Right. And if they go too long without a wet nappy, it might be worth uh, calling the doctor and letting him know that. If you give a dose of aconite, if you think, oh, they haven't had a wet nappy, mm -hmm. sometimes they're just a bit dehydrated because of their temperature. But often um, give them, you know, sips of water or, or, or teaspoons of water. And often you give an aconite and it will be followed by a wet nappy. But it is a sign that you need to look out for uh, in high temperature in children. And that's often uh, a sign that they need some aconite if they've had lots of dry nappies in a row and you're at all concerned. Next section, sore throats. Excuse me, can I get a tissue? Now, I have a slightly runny nose and I think I've got the beginning of a cold. And if I tell you that last night I went out for a drink with a friend and we were going, it was going to be, an, it was supposed to be a nice evening. We went out, so I went out with a top that didn't have sleeves in it and I thought we'd probably have a drink in the garden while it was nice and then go inside. And they didn't tell me, but they bought a puppy and they couldn't leave the puppy on its own. Gorgeous little puppy. So they said, oh, do you mind if we don't go in? And I said, no, I don't mind, but I didn't bring a card again. So we sat there for two hours and I was absolutely freezing cold. So what remedy do I need today? <laughs> Beginning of, a, of an acute, after chill, possibly aconite. So sore throat. First of all, what is the orthodox approach? What is needed? Sip warm liquids or if the patient prefers, eat cold or frozen liquids such as ice pops. Gargling with salt water, sucking on throat lozenges if your child is old enough uh, and as usual from the St. John's Ambulance, paracetamol or ibuprofen. These are things which I guess most people who rely on homeopathy have in their first aid cabinet but rarely use. If they can help it, they'll try a remedy first and usually that's going to work really well and they don't need to, to, to use the, the, the paracetamol, the calpol or the ibuprofen. Uh, the less the better. 
<laughs> Occasionally it's useful. Seek medical care if your child has difficulty swallowing or breathing, is drooling in a young child. That often means that their throat is so swollen that they can't swallow their own saliva. Tires very easily, has a lot of pus in the back of the throat, or has a sore throat that lasts for longer than a week. Hip ourself is the first remedy we're going to cover. Homeopathy is fantastic for sore throats. It's fantastic for everything, let's face it. We just have to get the remedy right and then you're home and dry with homeopathy. Um, but hip ourself is a, is a really useful remedy homeopathically. And again, we may revisit this uh, a couple of times. As usual, you need to remember, write, uh, you know, if you've got a highlighter with you, the words that I've put in black type, highlight them or underline them because they're the words that when you look back on your notes, you want to, to pay particular attention to those words as they are the keynotes of the remedy. So hip ourself. So a patient who needs this remedy is likely to feel extremely cold and again be worse for chill. They're also quite likely to be an irritable patient, short-tempered, really don't want to, uh, to communicate much with you. This could be quite a severe sore throat, it doesn't have to be. Uh, but it could be. This could be quite an infected sore throat and perhaps even have pus on the tonsils with a kind of quite foul smelling breath. Hep ourself is sometimes referred to as the homeopathic antibiotic because it's useful for dealing with severe infections. It's a great remedy for nasty infections. But we can use it in less severe acutes as well. The pain in the throat is like a a sharp splinter, a sticking pain in the throat, similar to a feeling of a fishbone stuck in the throat. The patient usually wants warm drinks and feels worse for anything cold and the pain might extend into the ears when the patient swallows. If you remember when I talked about the etiologies and so on earlier on. I said the daughter had a sore throat um, that came on when she got chilled, that felt like a fishbone in her throat, that was worse for anything cold and she wanted a warm drink. And that was the, the, the remedy that we said might be useful for her. Uh, it was the HEP herself. But it's a, a great remedy. And it, obviously we don't have a homeopathic antibiotic because we have to have the symptoms have to match. But this is a very big remedy who, when there's, a when there's a severe infection, the symptoms will quite often match and it may be a remedy that uh, you, you can, and can give for things uh, other than sore throats. I, my experience of this remedy was I went up to visit my sister in Scotland and I got an infection down the side of my nail. In Scotland we call them Whitlows, I think their proper name is Panerichium. But you know, I, I don't know whether you've ever had that, an infection down the side of your finger. I thought, oh, that's a bit tender. The next day I got up, it really, really hurt. And I thought, oh, I should maybe uh, go to the chemist and get something for that. And I was thinking about a remedy, but I also thought maybe a poultice or something. I, it was Scotland, it was cold. I went out. When as soon as I got out into cold air, it really hurt much, much more. When I knocked it against anything, it really, really hurt. I was feeling really irritable with it. And I went to the chemist and I said, I've got this really sore finger. And uh, she said, oh, you need antibiotics for that. I said, well, I don't have a fever. I'm not unwell in myself. There's nothing systemic going on. It's only in my finger. I don't think I need antibiotics. Oh, I would have antibiotics for that. I said, I was really wondering if you had, you know, something to draw it, like a poultice. No, no, go to your doctor, get antibiotics. All right. I went to a health food shop and I got some HEP herself because I didn't have my remedies with me up there. I got HEP herself. Beautiful. Cleared it beautifully. But all of those things, worse for cold, worse for touch, extremely painful, uh, um, really, really helped. So it is a great remedy for... Uh, infections anywhere if the symptoms agree. You'll see when we do our recaps 
uh, we're going to often do a recap for something like Belladonna. Um, and I can't remember if we're doing a recap for Belladonna on throats. Possibly we are. But even in that situation with a finger, if the finger, what would my finger have been like if I had decided this is an early stage of infection in my finger and I'm going to take some Belladonna, what would I have had? Good, yes, yes. All you need to do is, if, if you know, if you understand the keynotes of belladonna, you'll recognize it, whatever the situation is. If my finger was really hot, really red, and really throbbing, I would probably have chosen belladonna for the same complaint. As it was, it was sharp pain, it was worse for cold, it was worse for touch, and I felt cranky, and therefore I chose the hip ourself. So remember, we're not prescribing for the complaint, we're prescribing for my experience of the complaint. And so different remedies can be required. So as we go through these throat remedies, they're all remedies for sore throats. But what we're trying to help uh, to do is to help you to remember the remedies, not so much the complaints, but the remedies really, and their best applications, which is what we're doing here. And once you know a remedy really well, you'll recognize it whenever it comes up for whatever complaint it comes up in. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So back to throats then. So, so hep R self. Uh, all of these are, are, are the keynotes of hep R self. Cold, irritable, maybe nasty infections. They could be, if there's a in nasty infection, could smell bad. So an ear infection, if a child had an ear infection, they'd be the same. They'd be cold. Maybe the ear would smell bad. They'd be cranky. They wouldn't want you to look in it. And if they could describe it, it would be a pokey pain. Uh, and it would be worse when they were out in the cold. So all of these apply to the throat too. Worse for swallowing, like a fish bone stuck in the throat, maybe going up to the ears. Worse for anything cold and maybe slightly soothed by some warm a warm drink. Lycopodium. This is a form of moss, a club moss. Lycopodium is a big throat remedy and when we need lycopodium usually when we ask about the location it's going to be right-sided. Certainly it will start on the right although it may move to the left but the right side is nearly always where the worst aspect of the throat is and maybe the whole right tons will be swollen and there might be glands up in the right side of the neck. Typically, doesn't happen in every complaint, but typically lycopodium are worse at between four o'clock and eight o'clock. It may be with a sore throat that may, maybe it's not their throat that feels worse, but they just suddenly feel overpoweringly tired and need to lie down. They don't feel good between those hours. The sore throat that requires lycopodium is very soothed by a warm drink. They also have a devilish sweet tooth, so they might want a sweet drink like a Ribena or a warm, uh, a warm sweetened drink. So those are the keynotes of the lycopodium sore throat. Right side, better for warm drinks. Tired in the afternoons, often want to have sweet things. And quite often, when somebody is in a lycopodium situation, one of the concomitants they have is bloating in their belly or a lot of wind. This next remedy is almost the opposite of lycopodium. This is lachesis. This is a surukuku bushmaster snake. And the remedy is made from the lachesis venom. And in something like 100 and 60 years, uh, only two snakes have ever suffered for the sake of humanity. Uh, and Lachesis, very similar uh, in some respects, but completely opposite sides and opposite modalities. So it's similar in that it has a very distinct side of the throat. This time it will be the left. But as the lycopodium starts on the right but may extend to the left, lycopodium will start on the left, may extend to the right, but generally it's the left side that is affected. They're worse on waking in the morning. Their throat will be worse in the morning than it will be at any other time. And they won't want a hot drink at all, they will want a cold drink. 
and even the outside of their throat may be aggravated by touching it and they won't want anything, a necklace or a collar against their throat. And they may weirdly be better for eating something solid, as if they, if they ate a piece of toast, as if it would almost scratch their throat and make it feel a bit better. They quite like something solid, uh, but if they want to drink it, it will definitely be a cold drink that they want. These are very frequently used remedies for quite nasty sore throats. Another remedy that we use for nasty th sore throats are mercury. Mercury, like arsenicum, is both a metallic mineral and a very toxic one at that. But again, keep saying it, rendered safe and effective by the homeopathic potencies. And mercury has a very distinctive picture. The throat will be very, very swollen, very, very painful. The tongue will often be markedly coated. That you may see it even when someone's just talking without you having to say, stick your tongue out, let me see your tongue. You'll notice it when they're talking because it might be quite lurid or thickly coated yellow. And their tongue might be swollen, slightly frilly around the edges, if you know what I mean by that. The books call it a pie crust tongue. That's kind of quite a visual image, just that their tongue may be floated frilly around the edge. They may find it almost impossible to swallow even their own saliva if it's very bad and that might lead to them dribbling. And the glands in their neck will be swollen, quite enlarged. The books call mercury the human thermometer. They can't reach a comfortable temperature. One minute they're putting on an extra layer, the next minute they're taking everything off, and then they're taking it, putting it back on again, then taking it off again. They may sweat profusely and again, their perspiration might smell offensive. When we have a patient with a really nasty infected sore throat, we might be having to make the choice between it's quite nastily infected and there's pus in the throat. It smells bad. They've got a bit of bad breath going on there. Uh, could it, they've got glands up. Could it be hepar self? Could it be mercury? They, they look quite similar. What we're going to do then is we're going to differentiate between them by looking at what is their temperature like. Because we said that the HEPAR is really chilly, one of the coldest remedies that we have. They're really cold, they can't get warm. Whereas we've said with the mercury, one minute they're cold, one minute they're hot, then they're cold again, then they're hot again. So that's one way we can try and identify which is the appropriate remedy. The other one is we said that the hep ourself is much, much worse for anything cold. It doesn't bother the mercury person so much. So we're going to just try it by looking at all those clams again and sort of matching them up with what we know of each remedy. How many ticks can we put? Again, we'll write all their symptoms down. So we might put hep ourself next to um, they, that they've got smelly breath or they've got pus on their tonsils, we might put an M next to it there as well. But they're chilly, so we'll put an H next to that and we won't put an M next to that. And then we look and see and count up how many H's we've got and how many M's we've got, and that will decide whether we're giving the HEPAR or the mercury. And we might be trying to choose between a number of remedies, but we just list all the symptoms that we've been able to get. We might have managed to take seven symptoms from our patient and there might be in those seven symptoms, there might be four points for mercury, there might be five points for hepar self, and there might be two points for rust tox. And so the one that has the most ticks next to it is the one that you're going to try first. It's a very simple way of doing it, really. And homeopathy can be as complex or as simple as you like. I, I know quite a few people who said, you know, I never had better results than when I knew very little. <laughs> There's some truth to that, you know, that sometimes we, we can overcomplicate life. And the thing to remember is that you can't do any harm with remedies. So if you f choose a remedy and you don't think it's working, you just choose your next favourite one. Having given it a bit of time, because a really nasty septic sore throat 
is going to take a little while to clear. You might want to be giving the remedy every couple of hours for a day and then leave them overnight and in the morning they might say actually I can swallow a bit better today or I'm not feeling quite as hot and sweaty. I feel, yeah, I feel a little bit more human today. And you think, okay, that is a good improvement in, in that length of time. Let's continue with the remedy today. We were doing every two hours yesterday. Let's do it every four hours today and see if they're better again tomorrow. And that's, that's kind of what we do. If you want to give Calpol, you can. There's not even any problem if you really felt scared in a situation and you really thought, no, I need antibiotics. You know, antibiotics don't always work. There's no harm in giving the remedies as well if you want to, uh, as a sort of belt and braces. You know, as homeopaths, we're not against antibiotics. They're and marvellous when the situation requires them. We'd be mad to say they are the devil's work. You know, of course, they're wonderful. Uh, but we, we see nowadays how many problems there are from people becoming resistant to antibiotics because they're given too readily. They're given too quickly. We need to trust that our body is able to heal itself and that when we've got a fantastic tool at our resource, like a homeopathic remedy, that very often we really don't need the antibiotics. Uh, but if we feel instinctively or that this is actually more than I can put up with, I want the antibiotics, we can actually ride both horses. But my view is always, I would always try remedies first. And if I feel that we're, we're improving, we don't need to, to go down that route. But certainly, uh, homeopaths generally are not anti-orthodox medicine. We're anti overuse of orthodox medicine with their various side effects when there's a nicer, safer, gentler alternative that may get you there faster uh, and without the side effects. Here we have a previous useful remedy alert. We talked about rust tox for sprains and strains, didn't we? And if you remember um, the, what the words that we put in black type when we looked at rust tox for strains and sprains we looked at overexertion of a part and so you may have a sore throat, we've talked about this a couple of times now, from doing all the singing. We said that Rustox is better for continued motion and worse on first motion. In your throat this may be expressed as worse on first waking. You've been, your throat has been still all night, you haven't really been swallowing much or talking much so when you wake up your throat is absolutely awful. But if you have a drink and you start talking and it loosens up, you might think, oh, it's not quite so bad. But come the evening when you've been talking all day, you might think, oh, my throat's really killing me again. So mornings and evenings are the worst times for the rust tox sore throat. And it often will come on when somebody has been overextending themselves. They will be better for warmth and better for hot drinks and the throat may feel stiff, the muscles of the throat may feel stiff, and the glands may be swollen. So if you remember the words that we used before, which is worse on first moving, better for continued motion, and worse again when you overdo it. So that's how that presents with the throat. Worse on waking, better walking, talk, talking, drinking, moving, and worse again in the evening and definitely better by warmth and warm drinks. Uh, this is a previous useful remedy alert of one we haven't done yet. What I'm trying to do here is keep the main remedy to one uh, complaint to make it as uh, straightforward as possible and then refer to it in sub-complaints. So this is a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not previous, but uh, in advance useful remedy alert because I'm going to tell you a little bit about apis here although we're going to cover apis when we do bites and stings okay but we already talked a little bit about apis when we did the case we said the son's throat he'd eaten a peach and his throat was scratchy and sore so remember uh, about apis these words you're going to see these words coming up every time we talk about apis because the throat will be swollen keynote of apis is there's a lot of fluid retention in the part that's what the word edematous means lots of swelling lots of, of of fluid retention and the uvula the little bit that hangs down at the back of your throat may be very swollen when you look at it, it may look like a little jelly bag swollen and shiny 
it might be sore due to an allergic response to something and the patient will tend to be much better for, for a cold drink or even something colder, sucking a cube of ice and definitely worse for warmth. It will feel more swollen, more inflamed for warmth and better for coldness and ice. We're going to recap on that uh, apis later on. Uh, but again, it's the keynote words, the words that are in italics, that when we do a remedy, once you get to remember those words in association with the remedy, you're pretty much home and dry. It takes a little time. There's a lot of remedies and the, it's quite complex. But as you go over your notes or, or watch the, uh, the, the film over again or, or recap in particular remedies, you'll get to know the remedies better and better and you'll get to understand when they might work and how they might work in different acutes. So that's uh, sore throats. now to headaches. So in headaches, orthodox approach, if a patient has a headache, uh, help them to sit or lie down. Again, give them something cold to hold against their head. This is typically, I think this is the advice to St. John's give for everything. A bag of cold peas in a towel, that's it. <laughs> But it, it can be a useful thing. And again, use the advice from St. John's is painkillers of paracetamol. Um, if the patient has other symptoms such as fever, vomiting, loss of responsiveness, obviously when you're worried, if you're concerned, if you think it's more than just a normal headache, don't hesitate uh, to get help. You know, if, if you take them to the doctor and the doctor says, don't worry, it's only this, that's fine. If you take them to hospital and they say, don't worry, it's not meningitis, it's just this, that's fine. You're better safe than sorry. If you're really concerned, nobody's going to get any rest, nobody's going to get any sleep for worrying. If you're worried, seek help. Never be embarrassed to be, oh, it wasn't anything after all. Always better to be on the safe side. And in those symptoms with fever and vomiting, of course, with, with those symptoms and loss of responsiveness, you'd be straight down to A&E. Also, if the headache has been because of a head injury, you also need to see a health professional because head injuries uh, can be dangerous. Uh, and if you have a headache and it isn't settling or it goes on for an undue length of time, uh, again, see a health professional. First remedy we're going to talk about today is bryonia. Bryonia is um, white hops, a climbing plant. The symptoms we're going to see are often a, a severe frontal headache. They may be right-sided. Don't have to be, but maybe that would be the commonest type of bryonia headache. And the headache might be described as bursting or splitting. It'll be described in quite sort of dramatic terms. The etiology might be, it was hot yesterday and I was working or uh, it's been Ramadan and I couldn't drink in the hours of daylight and uh, I couldn't get enough fluid in and it was a hot day and I got a really bad headache. So for whatever reason, somebody may have got themselves a little bit dehydrated and so they may have uh, dehydration. It's possible it could be a hangover. They drank too much alcohol which has dehydrated them and they didn't drink enough uh, water with it and now they've got a headache. Remember that hops comes from, uh, bryonia comes from hops. So it can also be a hangover remedy. The main symptom of a headache that requires bryonia, in fact, 
This is the keynote that tells us we're looking at a possible bryonia case, whatever the symptoms, if everything is worse for movement. The slightest movement hurts bryonia. If they have a headache, they want to lie with their head as still as possible. It may even hurt them to move their eyes. You know, if they move their eyes upwards, it might really hurt. It's like this if they have a, a cold, bryonia, their eyes hurt when they move them. They want to keep really still and they want stillness around them. They don't want things moving in their field of vision. They don't want, they just want stillness and they want to be very still. Any motion really aggravates them. Yeah, even the motion of the eyes. They're thirsty. We've said they may be dehydrated. They don't have to be dehydrated, but they may be. Well, whatever, they're a thirsty remedy. And they will be thirsty for drinks in big gulps. And their mouth and their mucous membranes feel dry. Dryness we've put in italics because it's uh, in bold, because it's another keynote feature of bryonia. They have a lot of dryness. Uh, sometimes people refer to it as dryonia because everything about bryonia is dry. Their mouth will be dry, their bowel will be dry, they'll be constipated, their eyes might feel dry. Uh, if they have a cough, it'll be a dry cough. They, they're, they're a very dry remedy and they tend to want to drink a lot. Uh, their headache will be worse for coughing. We're going to do a remedy recap for bryonia when we talk about coughs because it's also a very big cough remedy. But when they cough, their head's going to hurt. And if they have a headache, when they move their body a lot, like when you cough, it raises the intracranial pressure. Oh, that really hurts for bryonia. So their, worse, their head pain will be worse for coughing or sneezing, bending forwards, which again raises the intracranial pressure. And they may be better for pressure. So they may just want to sit with their head and their hands, or they may actually want to put a, put a bandage around their head, you know, hold it, something that, that holds it or lie in bed with their head on, uh, you know, the, the firm mattress. They like pressure. Everything is better from rest. They also like coolness and they like to lie on the affected part. They like pressure on the soreness. When the symptoms agree, bryonia might be good for a cough, a tennis elbow, a backache. When we see somebody with a tennis elbow and we think, could it be rust tox? Might it be bryonia? We're going to be able to tell pretty easily, aren't we? Because this symptom works for any motion. If it's a rust tox, they'll say, yeah, when I first move it, it hurts. But actually, if I give it a bit of a, uh, like this, it'll ease off and I, and I won't be too bad after a while. Bryonia will say, if I, I have to keep it really still, you know, maybe they'll want a sling uh, because that will help to keep it still. They also might say, I'd like a bandage, a pressure bandage on it to keep it firm because, uh, you know, I like the pressure on it and I don't want any motion. So the symptoms, the, uh, the, the symptoms that the patient has, remember, that's how we're going to differentiate those modalities again, that word. What makes it better? What makes it worse? And the bryonia remedy tends to be a bit irritable generally, a bit scratchy and a little bit like, you know, we said they want stillness. They want that stillness around them, as I said. They don't want noise. They don't want chatter. Can you just go away and leave me? Just leave, leave me in peace. I just want to lie here still in the dark and my headache will go away. Don't come in and talk to me. Don't put the light on. Don't bang the doors. Just stillness, please. Stillness and peace. That's what they like. And they'll be irritable if they're not able to get that. Yeah, they may live in a busy household and they're maybe not able to get an awful lot of peace when they're not well. And that will irritate them because uh, bryonia like that. They like stillness, peace, no motion. Whatever their complaint is, that's what they like. And probably a fair bit of water to drink as well. Gelsemian, yellow jasmine, pretty plant with a lovely scent. The headaches of gelsemium or gelsemium as it's sometimes uh, called, 
headaches might start in the neck and they might start off as a dull pain and they might feel like a tight band around their head as if they've got a hat on that's too tight they don't like that pressure it feels like they've got compression and their eyes feel that they want to close them and in fact when you look at somebody who needs gelsemium you might look at them and think, ah, they need gelsemium, their eyelids look like they're really heavy, look like they're looking at you through half open eyelids, they just uh, look like they're really tired. And you say, are you tired? They're, no, I'm not really tired, but my eyes do feel heavy. There's that slight droopiness to them. Gelsemium is a great remedy for anxiety of anticipation. And so some of their problems may come on when they are anticipating an event Maybe uh, they have an exam coming up. Maybe they have a driving test coming up and they're anticipating this event and they're getting tense and maybe they're going to get a headache. But a lot of their complaints are brought on by that anticipation. And sometimes their headache might be accompanied by double vision, where their vision feels strange and they, they have trouble, trouble focusing. Commonly with gelsemium, the patient might feel dizzy, weak or trembly. They feel shaky when they're unwell. Another of the keynotes, if somebody maybe had a flu that required gelsemium, we would see that they would have that heavy droopiness of the eyelids, that they'd feel shaky and weak. These are common symptoms, the ones that we're putting in in italics. For whatever the complaint is, if it requires gelsemium, these will be there. They may have a headache after shock or fright. One of our ailments from fright remedies. And a strange little symptom is that when they have a really bad headache, sometimes they go to the toilet, they have a profuse urination and they'll say, oh, a headache's feeling better. And that, all the books mark this as an a, a unusual symptom that belongs to, to gelsemium. But their complaints are often accompanied by that drowsiness and if they don't actually feel drowsy, they look drowsy. And when the symptoms agree, gelsemium could be used for influenza, stage fright and chronic fatigue. They're tired, they're a very tired remedy. And chronic fatigue may be, uh, for some people, come on the back of a adrenal fatigue and adrenal fatigue can come from shock or fright so we have to unravel the case in that sort of situation which is a more chronic complaint but just to let you know and we'll recap gelsemium when we do ailments uh, emotional acutes we'll also revisit gelsemium briefly uh, at the end today Nox vomica Nox vomica is a great remedy and it's probably best known for its use as a hangover remedy. It's probably one of the best things that works for hangovers. There are many old wives' tales and cures for a hangover, but I don't think any of them work as well as Nox vomica does if the symptoms agree. Nox as a remedy does tend to be fond of alcohol and stimulants. But the keynotes from Nox vomica, they may have a headache from a hangover, but it certainly doesn't have to be from a hangover. Generally, Nux vomica feel a bit toxic and a bit nauseous. The Nux vomica, the vomica part of that would, uh, would suggest that. This is actually strychnine. It comes from um, the Nux vom strychnos Nux vomica is its full name. And it's the nut that has a very high concentration of strychnine. Uh, so uh, generally they feel toxic and they feel nauseous. And they often have digestive uh, problems with all their complaints. They're a liverish remedy. They often don't feel quite right in their stomach, prone to heartburn, prone to indigestion, just just not great in their digestion. So they, we may see this for somebody who has migraines with vomiting. might be useful for that, although that's not an acute. Um, the pain is often in the front of the head. They're often worse for light and noise. They're often a person who doesn't suffer fools gladly, or at all. 
They're impatient, intolerant. They like everything done yesterday. If you've got an oxvomica for a boss, they will expect you to be superwoman or superman. But if you kind of are superwoman or superman, they will be very appreciative. They'll know your value. But if you were like, what was that again? How do I do that? Oh, I've made a mistake. They will have absolutely no patience for you to help you to say, well, you'll get better at it. Don't worry. No, no patience. They're a very impatient, intolerant person. But they're also a very lively, vivacious person who likes people. They're very family oriented. They're often constipated. And they maybe have headaches when they're constipated and headaches when they drink coffee. And they tend to be a slightly chilly person when they're unwell. And when the symptoms agree, Nux vomica can be useful for heartburn, insomnia, and nausea generally. Our biggest thing after headaches is probably just generally digestive dis dis discomfort, even to stomach ulcers. It's uh, in, in chronic cases, it's one of our big constitutional remedies, a very, very useful remedy, but we use it in acutes. And again, we're going to recap it a little bit, I think, when we do colds, because it's an acute cold remedy. So remember some of these words, especially the chilly person. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I forgot my slide. So yes, so this was where we said impatient and intolerant, constipated, headache from coffee, and very chilly. And we'll, we'll come back to, uh, to Nux briefly, at least once in, in the course of the next few slides. And for headaches, our first previous useful remedy alert, and I'm deliberately delaying this slide, Tell me what a patient who needs belladonna for their headache is going to feel like. Y yep. Y there you go. The headache might be described as throbbing. The head might feel full and hot as if they had too much blood in their head. Their face it might like a bit congested headache. They might be flushed with the, the headache. Their pains, their headache will be worse when they jar, when they put their foot down, when they sit down. They might, or they might not, but they might have slightly dilated pupils. And they may have a headache that comes on during fever, but it doesn't have to be. It can just be a congestive headache. But the keynotes are the heat and the throbbing and the slight flush of the face that tell us that we might be dealing with a belladonna situation. They will say, it's come on suddenly, and it's really bad. So those things happen with belladonna. They're sudden and they're intense and they're hot, they're red, they're throbbing. So you can see that we talked about belladonna for fevers, but we mentioned it that you might need it if you had a, an infection that was hot, red and throbbing. You might need it if you have a headache that fits most of those notes, those key words, because we're treating people and the people will be in a state with their complaint. If they're headache, they may be in a belladonna state, they may be in an ox vomica state, they may be in a, a, a bryony or... We're looking at the remedy and the symptoms of the remedy and matching it. So I'm going to be doing this once or twice, I'm going to say to you, you know this by now, if you know the remedy, well you don't know it by now, you've only just discovered them. But this is the way that you will learn when you need one remedy as opposed to the other, because you know the symptoms and you know the main things that you're going to use them for. And that's what I'm hoping you're going to be able to do at the end of this uh, session. You're going to recognize some of the remedies from their symptoms and you're going to know what ailments they're most likely to be able to help with. Okay. Um, we, we treat a lot of acute headaches and the, the headaches may come on their own or they may come as part of another complaint. Uh, so it, it could be uh, with fever, it could be with a cough or a cold, it could be after uh, 
a head injury, that they have a headache, in which case we'd be going back to the trauma remedies. So we need to kind of know what we're dealing with with the headache. And if people get frequent recurring headaches, like migraines, then we're really going to need to send them to a homeopath to have their case fully taken to find their constitutional remedy. always a nuisance, always makes people feel worse than they look. Uh, and they say a cold takes three days to come on, three days to be nasty, and three days till you feel fully better with it. Uh, and that's probably reasonably true, although uh, not always. So the first remedy we're going to talk about uh, for colds and for flu is Allium Sepa. Do you remember when we first started, we talked about the law of similars and we showed a picture of a lady chopping an onion. And we said that when you chop an onion, you get watery eyes, you get a runny nose, and those are also symptoms that we may get with a cold. So with the Allium Sepa, uh, we are going to have watery discharge from the eyes and the, the nose, often like a tap. I notice I haven't put my highlights on this one, um, but you would underline the watery discharge, please. It has a real flow, you know, what the, what the medical books call fluent coryza. That means it's not obstructed and a little bit drippy. It runs like a tap, very watery. And the eyes also are very, very watery. But the eyes uh, are um, burning. The eyes will be really sore and stingy. And the discharge that comes out of the eyes 
um, will be uh, kind of bland and it won't be sore to touch the skin, but the eyes will be stingy. However, the discharge that comes out of the nose will burn. It will burn the skin. So when the, when the fluid runs down across the, the, the upper lip, the, the philtrum here, may leave two red lines as if the discharge has actually burned the skin. And the symptoms are worse in the evening, worse in a warm room, but better for open air. So you would underline the burning of the eyes and the discharge irritating the upper lip and better for open air. Sometimes their nose dries up a bit at night and the, the, at night they find it hard to breathe through their nose. It's also very useful for uh, sleepiness and difficult concentration and it makes you feel tired and like you're not getting enough oxygen in when your nose is stuffy like that. And colds that move down to the larynx, they start in the nose and then they go to the throat and the throat feels raw. Rawness. And sometimes a kind of, um, the books say tearing pain in the larynx on coughing. So it's a very typical cold. It's not a really bad cold. It's not a really infected sinusy cold. It's just one of those colds, a bit like what I'm currently getting, which is just that your nose is running and it feels a little bit blocked and your eyes feel a little bit scratchy, but you don't feel particularly unwell, just a bit of a nuisance. Uh, it's also very useful for similar symptoms when somebody has hay fever. It's one of our hay fever remedies where you get a real watery discharge from the nose, maybe with quite a lot of sneezing, and the eyes are burny and gritty feeling and you may also get a little bit of a cough with it. Quite often our cold remedies are often our hay fever remedies too because it's not about the disease, it's about the symptoms and the symptoms of an acute cold and the symptoms of hay fever are very similar aren't they? I could be here saying oh it's the pollen, it's make my nose run and make me, you know, it, it, it could be uh, the, the symptoms are almost uh, in indistinguishable. Euphrasia. Eye bright is the is the name for euphrasia. It's a a plant which has often been used steeped uh, in boiling water and applied as compresses for sore eyes. That's how it's used herbally. Uh, and that's why it gets the name Eyebright. Again, I don't know why I forgot to do the highlighting on these. I think these were the last ones that I added into the slide presentation. Um, again, this works best on colds or allergies that affects the eyes, making them runny and sore. So it's very similar in its symptoms to Allium sepa because the symptoms of colds are broadly very similar with runny eyes, runny nose. The difference here that you can see is this affects the eyes more than it does the nose, whereas Allium sepa probably affects the nose more than it does the eyes. And in Allium sepa, it's the nose that has the acrid discharge. And in Euphrasia, it's the eyes that have the acrid discharge that may make the corners of the eye sore. I don't know if you've ever had that with a cold, that the tears make the edges of your eyes sore or almost the outer edge of your eyes feel like it might crack or, you know, it will be, be uncomfortable. So the, the uh, eyes will be runny and sore and the eyes might itch and burn. It also, because it's such a big eye remedy, it might even have a thicker discharge from the eyes. The eyes might have a, a slightly more um, yellowish discharge as if there was conjunctivitis there. It certainly is a remedy that we can use for conjunctivitis. And we said the discharge might make the skin around the eyes uh, quite, quite uncomfortable. Uh, 
Uh, the burning in the eyes might be worse in bright light. And again, a little bit like Allium Sepa, runs fluently in the day but might be more stuffed up at night. And again, a little bit like Allium Sepa, uh, coughing can be caused by irritation in the larynx, but there's a bit more mucus generally with Euphrasia. And their larynx is more irritated, where in Allium Sepa it's a bit more painful. Allium Sepa have a painful sort of tearing pain when they cough. Euphrasia is just a bit mucusy, and they think maybe their nose is dripping down the back and <coughs> making them cough. These are both straightforward cold remedies, but equally straightforward hay fever remedies. There's a, a, an, another combination that people often use for hay fever. It's called SAE, like stamped addressed envelope, but that stands for Sabadilla, Allium Sepa, and Euphrasia. Those three remedies are often combined for people who have severe hay fever symptoms of this nature and they can't choose between one or the other so they use all three of them and uh, those are sometimes remedies that you can buy in combination but again you can always get the remedies pop one of each in a bottle give it a shake and sip it throughout the day and that might be helpful for your hay fever or for an acute cold Natremure. I expect if you know anything about uh, homeopathy this will be a remedy that you are familiar with because second to arnica it's probably if arnica is our best known acute remedy natremure is our best known constitutional remedy it's a very deep acting remedy it's a, a big remedy a very important remedy for uh, the treatment of chronic diseases which of course is not what we're going to go into today uh, because it also happens to be a remedy that is really good for coughs and colds uh, and like these other remedies it's a very good remedy for those common colds where there's just a lot of mucus so we have colds that start with sneezing natremura great sneezers and they might notice that oh to you hurt you hurt you oh perhaps i'm coming down with something hurt you then an hour later, oh, I'm sneezing again, maybe I am getting a cold. And very often, it's the sneezing that's the first thing that they notice. See, I haven't sneezed at all, so I know I don't need natremure, because almost always natremure starts with sneezing. And they sneeze and they sneeze, and then their nose starts running, and it starts running clear and very watery, but often starts to thicken up a little bit. And it isn't really catarrhal but it's more like you know what the white of an egg looks like albuminous and slightly stringy so it's clear but slightly thicker than water and the nose can sometimes be very obstructed with it very typically with natremure there will be uh, a significant loss of smell and taste with the cold and if you say, what do you want to eat? I don't want to eat anything. I can't taste anything. <laughs> All so blocked up. They say, no point in me eating. Nothing tastes of anything because my nose is so blocked and I just, I'll just have something to drink because I can't taste. So it's a common feature of this remedy. They're a very big headache remedy. We didn't really include them in our headache because most often we're not going to use it so much for an acute headache. We're going to use it for those chronic headaches, migraine type of headaches, but it is a big headache remedy and they may have a headache with their cough. That slightly when their nose is congested and their eyes are a bit, they're just a bit, they say I feel a bit heady. That's often how they say it, like it's not like a real thumping headache with a cold, they just feel a bit heady with it. And another feature uh, that can be a uh, part of, of natremure is that they um, may develop cold sores around the lips. Herpes. Often, you know, with a, with a, a cold, sometimes they say, oh, I must be getting a cold. I've got a cold sore coming up. Some people get cold sores, but they don't get colds. Some people get colds, but they don't get a cold sores. But for natremure, the two often do go hand in hand. 
that they will, uh, when they get a virus, when they're a bit run down, uh, they, they will have a cold sore uh, around the lips. They're also quite a dry remedy. And the dryness, they'll, they, they may be quite thirsty and they may have dryness of the lips. They'll want to use a lot of um, lipstick, not lipstick, lip salves, chapstick, and they may have cracks develop at the corners of their mouth. And their sneezing and their sore eyes may be worse for bright light. This is uh, partly more of the constitution of Natremure, and when we did Nuxvom, we hinted at the kind of constitutional type of person when we said Nuxvom, they're kind of driven and they're hurried and they want you to do everything yesterday and they, you know, uh, that type is, is their, their character when we're looking at constitutional. And I guess these type of things are typical for Natremure's character, but you might see them uh, developing in someone who has a Natremure type cold. And that's usually, they like to be left alone, a bit like the Bryonia, but in particular, they don't want any fuss. Look, don't fuss over me. Look, it's only a cold. You know, it's only a cold. Yeah, if you, well, if you must do something, just make me a cup of tea and then go off and leave me in peace. Just, I'll be fine. They don't like uh, sympathy. They don't like fuss. This is how they are generally. They like to be independent. They don't like consolation and fuss. They like to be seen as strong and they don't like to show their vulnerability. So when they're ill, they'll often just take themselves off and say, look, don't make a fuss of me. I'm absolutely fine. I'm just going to go to bed and I'll be fine soon. Because they don't want people to say, oh, but you've got such and such. and Oh, let me massage your... No, just leave me alone. They don't want that sort of fuss and attention. Other remedies love it. Uh, there are some remedies. We're going to talk about a remedy in, under coughs. Pulsatilla. We could put pulsatilla under colds. If we did put pulsatilla under colds, it would be the cold that gets thick green mucus. And that children get these type of colds a lot. You know, they have a, a cold which very quickly goes to thick, snotty green uh, mucus and they want the fuss. They want cuddles. Oh, make me a cup of tea. Come and give me a hug. You know, oh, get me an extra blanket. They like the hugs and the fuss and the cuddles. Uh, so they're very different from Natremure, the Pulsatilla. We'll cover it in coughs, but remember it for colds. Colds, they say, that have ripened and become uh, more, catarrhal co more catarrhal colds, rather than the, the, the Allium sepa, the Euphrasia, the Natremure, which have the thinner We've started with the thinner ones and Natremure is heading to thickening up a little bit. It's the egg whitiness. The next one in line there would be Pulsatilla uh, and that would be the, the needy, clingy, wanting a bit of fuss and having thicker, yellower mucus. And the last one we're doing uh, in full there is, the, is Thuya. Now Thuya is a less common remedy uh, but it can be useful. It's uh, available as a, an over-the-counter remedy that you can buy in a health food shop and it's included in, in many kits. And one of its uses is sometimes colds, and some people are very prone to this, and we'll see that it may go from uh, early stages of, of a, you know, a clear cold uh, to the slightly thicker stage or to the mucousy stage, but some people really get sinus infections after a cold. They'll always say, I hate if I get a cold, going to go to my sinuses. And through you might be useful after a cold when the sinuses have been affected. Uh, there will usually be a lot of thick green mucus. And often they may have a headache. The headache might be in small, well-defined areas, as if a nail is being pushed into their head. And their headache will be really quite unpleasant, and when they bend forward, they may shout, because the pain will, of their sinus headache will be so much worse when they bend forward, that they'll bend forward and they'll make an exclamation, oh God! get up again quickly because they've just like felt everything in their head or their face and the pain might well 
extend to the left side of the face. Left-sided sinusitis. Older sinus symptoms might be worse when it's cold or damp weather. And the pain can move to the teeth when they blow their nose. Your, si your maxillary sinuses in your face run right above your teeth. So sinusitis, sometimes people think they've got a, a, a tooth infection. And the dentists say, no, your teeth are fine. It's probably your sinuses. So if you've had a bad cold and you've had a lot of mucus and you've had a bit of a heavy sinuses and you suddenly develop toothache, it may be actually still your sinus is playing up. And if it's on the left side of your face, uh, you could consider taking this remedy through you. It helps to dry up thick mucus, usually yellowish or green left side sinuses where there's a lot of pain in the head and face. Just to mention there, probably the best, well, the, the, the thing that Thuya is best known for uh, is actually treating warts and verrucas. That's the other acute thing that people buy it for. If they're not buying it for their clearing their sinusitis, they're most often buying it because it's one of our biggest remedies for helping to clear warts and verrucas. It's a, almost a specific remedy for that. And a simple veruca or a simple wart may respond beautifully to daily dosing of thuya for a little while until it disappears. Sometimes people come and they have a lot of verrucas or a lot of warts, which may uh, have a, a, an implication for their overall immunity, that their immunity is low. And that might mean that in order to get rid of the warts or verrucas, we need to work on them constitutionally. But often, just a simple water of Aruka, uh, we're going to see that uh, Thuya can deal with that. So that's Thuya for, for you. Mainly sinuses or occasionally warts and Verrucas. We've got a previous useful remedy alert coming up for colds. We've said about it already really, is aconite. So remember what we're going to see in aconite uh, in colds. Remember, aconite is very useful at the very first signs of a, a, a cough or a cold. If we take it quickly, we might be able to ward it off. Often the ailments that, have, uh, that require uh, aconite come on after being chilled or exposed to cold wind or just not being able to get warm for a long time. They'll have a very runny nose drip like a tap, like the other early stage remedies. They may be slightly feverish with it. And they may sometimes develop other of the um, uh, aconite symptoms of fever, anxiety and restlessness. And sometimes in children that dry, croupy cough. How many doses would you give? For a cold? For a cold, getting into sort of fluey, fluey stage. Again, you would give the remedies probably every few hours for a day or so. It's not, we've said a cold takes three days to come, three days there, three days to go. You might half that time with a remedy, but it's still going to take a few days. So you're not going to take a remedy and think, hey, that's it. Although I have had just that amazing experience with taking an oxvomica once when our cold was coming on. I took an oxvomica 200 and I thought, what? Well, it, just, it just went. Normally, it's not quite as wonderful as that, but it can be. Normally, you, you take it and you might need to take it every few hours. If it's a simple cold, the next day they think, yeah, I'm not, my nose isn't running so much today and uh, I don't feel quite as heady. And you just continue on with the next day. And they might be pretty much over it within three days or so. With flu, flu is a worse state than a, than a cold. And with flu, you might need to be dozing every sort of four to six hours for three or days or so uh, and looking out for minuscule changes that tell that, you, you, that you're on the right route. It's difficult because there are, no, there are no hard and fast rules. I can't say you give every remedy this often. It's not quite that simple. But the rules are that if it's something that is going to generally take a, a quite a while to clear, you might be able to half that time with remedies, but it's still going to take some time and that you have to give remedies
quite a little while to work. If it is a longer uh, type of ailment, they may, you may need to be given them for 24 hours before you change them. On the other hand, real, uh, uh, you know, acutes like a high fever, the remedies are going to bring the fever down within half an hour seriously that quick. The screaming uh, chamomilla baby, it's going to soothe them within 10 minutes. And once they're soothed, you don't need to give any more until it comes back. So there's no hard and fast rules. We basically say if you think the remedy's working, keep dozing until they really are significantly better. But if the symptoms go completely, then you can stop dozing. It's fairly simple. Always remember you can't do any harm by giving the remedies, so you can stop and start again if you think you stop too early, or you can keep on a little if you're a bit uncomfortable about stopping too soon. With the cold, we have one more previously useful remedy alert, and this is Nux Vomica. And Nux Vomica, we said, may also be a remedy for an early stage of those runny colds. They may, unlike the aconite who's been chilled, they may have been out drinking and having fun, not getting to bed on time, only getting three hours sleep, wearing themselves out, a terrible thing, with fun. Uh, so illness after excess, you know, they've drank too much, they're a bit toxic, their body's just got a bit run down. And they will have sneezing, a bit like Nature Muir, with this real discharge on waking and their nose very very obstructed at night and they might lie on one side that's obstructed so they turn to the other side and the obstruction moves to the side that they lie on they're very chilly they're always a chilly patient they may be irritable and impatient and you think oh god i hope they get better soon they're a nightmare when they're ill really difficult patients and also I don't know if you've ever had a cold like this, and equally, like we've said, these are often the, the, the runny ones, are often hay fever remedies too. That itching inside your ear and your throat where you can't quite get at it, and people sometimes make a noise like a <coughs> or something as if they want to scratch inside there. And Nux vomica has that itching in the eustachian tube somewhere between their ear and their throat that they can't quite get at. That slightly sort of itchiness in there can be. Uh, a little bit irritating. We're starting next session, next uh, is, is bites and stings. So again we're going to look at the orthodox first aid for bites and stings and according to St John's Ambulance, if the sting is visible, brush or scrape it off sideways, don't use tweezers to try and pull it out or you might squeeze more poison into the wound. Put an ice pack or something cold on the wound to reduce the swelling, <laughs> that's the same again. <laughs> Raise the part of the body that is affected. And if the sting is in the mouth or throat, get the patient to suck an ice cube or sip cold water. Keep checking the casualties, breathing, pulse and levels of response, I guess just in case there's an allergic response. And if there is an allergic reaction, um, call for medical help. Fairly straightforward there. So the first remedy that we're going to cover uh, is apis, apis mel. We talked about this as being one of the, uh, of the animal remedies that we use and it's made from a honeybee. And the, 
again, the we, we've we've got back to our um, bold words. Uh, so uh, again, the, the the words in bold are the the words that we really need to make sure that we uh, remember. And in apis, the affected part will be red. It'll be red to look at, and the area around the bite will be swollen. With apis, there's always the possibility that there'll be a significant amount of fluid retention or swelling of the part. It's our most fluidy remedy. The, the part may be, you know, they, they, they call it pitting, so that if you have a really swollen uh, part, fluidy, you push your finger in and it leaves an indentation, it's called pitting, and this the, the part can be so swollen as to pit under pressure or it may be really tight and shiny uh, and stretched. If people have this in their fingers, they'll say, my fingers are like sausages. You know, they don't bend properly. They, they feel stiff like sausages because they have so much fluid in them. So this is something we see. Any problems that may require apis, we're likely to see uh, a degree of uh, edema or fluid uh, around the affected part. The pains, the type of pains or the sensation that we're looking for are stinging pains, which you would expect uh, from anything uh, that comes from a, a bee. But we're not just expecting it to be a stinging pain when it has come from a sting. But if it's for, we talked about this for sore throats, it may have a stinging pain in the throat. So stinging pains even when we're not actually dealing with stings. Marked relief for anything that requires apis from cold things and even more specifically ice. They love ice and ice cold applications for whatever uh, they have. So supposing somebody gets stung by a, a bee or a wasp, it doesn't have to be a bee just because it's a bee sting, it could be a wasp, it could be a horsefly, it could be a mosquito. But you might have, you know, some people can be bitten by a mosquito and it's like nothing. Other people can be bitten by a mosquito and it's, oh, you know, they have huge swellings. More typical of apis. And then we have big blistering. So with apis, it'll be hot, red, very swollen, maybe edematous, and definitely they will feel better when they put something really cold on it. If they hold an ice cube onto it or something like that, it'll make it feel much, much uh, more pleasant for them. And anything warm will really aggravate. Pain of, of any sort will be worse for warmth. Uh, they may also get an allergic reaction to the bite or sting. Uh, and so adjacent parts might swell. You know, if they got stung on the cheek, they might actually have a swollen tongue. Uh, apis is our biggest remedy for generalized allergic response, where there's a big histamine reaction, the tissues are suffused with fluid, there's a lot of swelling. And, you know, if somebody has a real anaphylactic uh, reaction, obviously people who know they have a, um, that kind of reaction often carry an EpiPen, but supposing somebody has a, a, a bad uh, reaction to something, they don't have an EpiPen and you're waiting for the ambulance to come, if you have APIS, APIS may uh, actually may save a life because it may restrict the amount of swelling, may restrict the amount of fluid that's uh, going into the affected part uh, and may stop the airways blocking or anything. So it's unusual for us to use it for anything quite as dramatic or severe as that. We're mostly going to use it for milder allergies and um, reactions to bites and stings. But it's a, a brilliant remedy. But remember those keynotes, the swelling of the part with a lot of fluid in it. That's a very strong feature uh, of, of apis mel. The next remedy, this is a, a really pretty plant, uh, Ledum palustre. Uh, I think it's a form of marshmallow or something. And Ledum is a really interesting remedy. Another one of these remedies which has more about it than uh, you realize when you first learn about it. Because it is one of our remedies that is taught for acute and its main feature is for ailments from a puncture wound. So a puncture wound obviously includes 
uh, a bite or a sting. And so this is what we're going to talk about first. So if you get stung by uh, something, the area around the sting, if it requires leadum, will actually feel cold. Unlike apis, where it will feel hot and it will look red and hot. Unlike apis, this won't feel red and hot, it will feel cold. The skin will look puffy, but not as edematous as the apis. And the, uh, the part, although it feels cold, like capus, they want cold application onto it. So the difference is really that the part feels cold and the, uh, the part in apis feels hot. Also, the discoloration in, in leadum will be a little bit more purplish, as if there's a bit more blue in red and a bit of blue, which makes purple. So the swelling may be slightly more purplish in leadum and very red in uh, apis and hot in apis and cold in leadum, but they both want a cold application for it. So a couple of other things about leadum, uh, although we're really talking about it for its burns and stings, it is an interesting remedy and it's a useful remedy for any puncture wound. So it doesn't have to be a bite or sting. If somebody uh, rammed a pencil through your hand or something, it, that would be a perfect leadum situation. Uh, so it's useful for any puncture wounds, not just bites and not just stings. Any injury that's come from a deep, a deep wound. Uh, and I had a patient who, he was coming to see me with migraines, cluster migraines. His character was a very irritable kind of guy uh, and everything I learned about him, I thought he required the remedy Nux Vomica. It was really very strong picture of, of Nux Vomica, but Nux Vomica did nothing for him. And the next time he came back and he said, I'm no better, nothing's changed, you know, and uh, I was surprised because it had been what I thought was a very good match. But in the meantime, he'd received an injury, and I can't remember what that injury was. I think it was a, ne a needle had gone right into his hand, and he'd had to go to the hospital to get it out. And I said, oh, that must have been unpleasant, and I was thinking about Liedem. He said, no, not if you're me. He said, I'm quite used to it. And I said, how do you mean you're quite used to it? He said, he said uh, well, he said, I didn't go into all of this when I saw you last. You know, I didn't know whether you wanted to know about accidents, uh, you know, but, <laughs> but he said, when I was a little lad, and he was a bit of a geezer, really nice guy, very funny, had me in stitches. He said, when I was a little lad, he said, well, I, I was a bit naughty like. He said, and I climbed out the window of my bedroom and I fell onto the sharp railings below and I impaled myself through the leg on the sharp railings and the other leg went at a funny angle he said and they couldn't get me off the railing so they had to call the fire brigade and the fire brigade came and they sawed the railing down and they took me to hospital with the railing in my leg uh, and I broke one leg and I had this uh, big spike through my other leg which they had to I was in hospital for a while and when I came out of the hospital I was in a wheelchair for a while in the summer. He said, so my big sister, he said, uh, she was put in charge of me and she had to wheel me around and keep me occupied while my mum was busy. He said, one day, a wasp went down her t-shirt and stung her on the chest. So she was frantically trying to get the wasp out. So we have another puncture wound here, even though it wasn't on, on, on this guy. She let go of the wheelchair. The wheelchair sailed off on its own along the road, down a hill, up a path and straight through a plate glass window whereupon he broke both his arms and lacerated them. <laughs> honestly, I was laughing. I said, this isn't really true, is it? He said, he says, honest to God, I'm sitting here. That's what happened. Um, so it, as his story unfolded, this man had had more puncture wounds than anyone has a right to have if they'd lived 10 lives. He worked on a building site and he had umpteen puncture wounds, including a nail gun through through his hand. Uh, he'd been stabbed twice, once uh, for a bag of chips, and he'd been stabbed in the upper arm. It wasn't serious, but, it, you know, I said, I can't believe how many puncture wounds you, you've had. So I gave him lead him. 
And uh, as I looked at Liedem, I realized that it actually has some similarities to Nux. They both like a drink. They're both kind of quite impatient and forthright and direct. Uh, and you know, the remedy, it was amazing for him. When he came back, he said, I haven't had a single headache. He said, I felt better than I've felt for years. My wife remarked, you know, I think I'm going to go and have some of that. You know, I've never seen you so cheerful. Uh, and yet, had he not come back and had that n not happened with the needle, I may not have heard about the, the, the funny tales of his numerous puncture wounds uh, and have arrived at the remedy Liedem, which was wonderful for him. So any puncture wounds where somebody has had a nasty deep injury is also one of the remedies that we consider for um, tetanus and tetanus prevention and treatment. If you are in, bitten by a tick, it may help prevent Lyme. It's said to be able to push venom out of, of a wound. So a snake bite or anything, it may save a life. I've read about this in umpteen books and there's documentations of that if you give Liedem immediately after a snake bite, it may lessen the amount of venom. If you give it after a tick bite, it may prevent Lyme. I gave it to a lady two years ago who'd had mosquito bites. And when she came back, she said, um, it helped. She said, but, she said, I hadn't talked about this either because I don't tell everyone. It's a kind of need to know basis. But I'd had uh, fillers put in my face and uh, about a week before I came to see you. And when I took that remedy, it all started leaking out of the, out of the puncture holes. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And I, I said, oh gosh, I said, I'm, I, you know, obviously I didn't know she'd had that procedure anyway. But that convinced me that Liedem does actually throw out toxins from the site of entry. So it's a really interesting remedy. And when the symptoms match, it may also be a good remedy for gout, especially in the big toes and in the ball of the foot, but also for our arthritis generally. So it has a number of, uh, of uses. But the, 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 the use we're mainly focusing on today is the the puncture wound that comes from a bite or a sting. Uh, you can give apis when the symptoms match, you can give ledum when the symptoms match, or you could give ledum straight away to try, uh, if you know you've just been bitten, to try and uh, eject some of the venom at the point of entry and then wait and see what the symptoms are and either continue with the ledum or, or go on to the apis. We're also going to do a previously useful remedy alert and it's our old friend belladonna remember if the part affected is very hot very red it may look a bit like the apis but you won't want the cold on it so much and it will throb it will just really you know like in cartoons you see somebody who's been bashed with something and they've got this kind of light going on and off on their finger or something that's kind of how it feels in belladonna there is a real kind of throb going on so if it's really throbbing hot and red belladonna may also be useful in insect bites and stings and also previous remedy alert hypericum if there's a sharp shooting pain after the bite or the sting, especially if it travels along a nerve pathway. Now we're moving on to diarrhea and vomiting. Again, the St. John's Ambulance uh, say the symptoms might be feeling sick, maybe vomiting, maybe bloodstained vomit, maybe severe cramping pains in the stomach, diarrhea and headache or fever. The advice is tell the person to lie down and rest. Give them plenty of water and a bowl to use in case they're sick. 
Encourage them to drink as much water, even if they can only manage regular small sips. And if they have diarrhea, it's even more important that they drink water to replace lost fluids. Giving them oral rehydration solution may be a good way to replace fluids lost through diarrhea and through vomiting. And you can buy these in most good chemists and the solution can replace the salts and the other minerals which they've lost uh, through the fluid loss. Uh, if the person gets worse or if you're really worried, again, call and get uh, advice. So we've mentioned this remedy already, our Senecum album. And we mentioned it when we were looking at like cures like and how the symptoms of arsenicum poisoning can mimic the symptoms of uh, diarrhea and vomiting, how, they, how the symptoms can be very close. So let's have a little look at the symptoms here. So arsenicum, it's, a, it's one of our main remedies for stomach ailments with diarrhea. It's a really commonly used remedy. But whenever anyone has food poisoning, it's not the only remedy to use, but it's probably the number one remedy we're going to think of. So they're going to have diarrhea, which may be loose and watery. You know, will really pour out of them. It's not even semi-solid. Sorry, <laughs> not a nice discussion. But it's literally going to pour out of them. And they may have nausea and vomiting along with it. Particularly unpleasant if you're going both ends at the one time. I'm sure most people have had that at some point in their life due to something like the norovirus or food poisoning or some other gastric uh, mishap. Uh, and it's not a pleasant situation and you want to be out of that situation as quickly as you possibly can. So there may be nausea, there may be vomiting and typically arsenicum, when we say what is the sensation, Often for arsenicum, the sensation is burning. When they vomit, they may feel like they've burned all their esophagus or their throat from the vomiting, maybe a bit acidic. When they have diarrhea, they may feel that the diarrhea feels a bit acidic and it feels like it burns at their back passage. The arsenicum patient has very marked weakness. They feel very, the words the books use is prostrated. They just have no energy. They feel quite almost collapsed, like they could hardly get up to go to the toilet. It's going to take all of their energy. They feel seriously weak. Their body temperature is very low. They're an extremely chilly remedy. They find it very hard to get warm. They'll want to have lots of layers on and lots of blankets on and be really, and even then hot water bottles and hot drinks very chilly and need a lot of uh, effort to, to warm them up. They also, we mentioned before that they're quite a, an anxious remedy and they need a lot of company and a lot of reassurance. They particularly, they like company anyway, they, they don't really like being on their own, but they particularly want company when they're ill. Uh, and partly it's because they, are, they have a little bit of hypochondria, you might say. You know, they, their fear is that they're going to be really ill. And their fear is that they're going to be really ill and there's nobody there to help. What if I faint and fall unconscious because I feel so weak and there's nobody to help me? Uh, that, that's their fear. So they, if they're unwell, they say, oh, don't go out. Would you stay with me? I really feel I don't want to be on my own. Uh, it's a big feature of arsenicum. Of course. Some people don't have anybody that they can say that to, so they're used to being on their own, uh, whether they're ill or not, and so that may not always come out strongly in the consultation. But they're always anxious about their health. And they're thirsty for small sips. As opposed to, do you remember what remedy is thirsty for large amounts? Bryonia, yeah, good. Bryonia is thirsty for large amounts and arsenicum are thirsty, but they'll have little sips and then they'll stop, little sips and then they'll stop. And even though they have burning pains, they like warmth. They like a warm application, uh, they like a warm drink. So even though they might have a burning pain in their throat, they might like a significantly hot drink. It's part of the constitutional picture of arsenicum album is to be very fastidious. That means a really tidy, clean, hate disorder. 
Do, if you have a, a, a an arsenic and patient in your your clinic and you're treating them for maybe something a bit more constitutional, uh, they will actually possibly start tidying things on your desk and you know putting them in a in a neat row. Or if you have a picture on your wall that's slightly squint, they'll keep looking at it and then they'll carry on talking. They'll look at it again. Sometimes you can deliberately do it just to flush out the arsenicums. <laughs> they'll, they'll look at it and they'll carry on talking, look at it, and eventually they'll say, do you mind if I just neaten that? They just hate any disorder. One time I, was, I had a patient, it was an acute, strangely enough, it wasn't a diarrhea case, it was a throat infection. Uh, and arsenicum isn't one of our biggest remedies for throat infections. We've done a lot of the remedies for throat infections. You know, the lycopodium, the lachesis, the belladonna, the, the rust tox, and so on, and the hepar self. So I had given her, I think I'd given her hepar self, and it hadn't worked. And she phoned me. Uh, she was my receptionist for years, this lady. And she phoned me. She said, I tried the hip herself. It's really no better. I'm, I feel terrible with this. She said, I really feel terrible. And my throat is awful. And I said, well, tell me again how you feel. She said, well, my throat is really, really raw. It's almost burning. She said, I feel weak and exhausted. She said, and I want warm drinks. And I feel really, really achy. Um, and... Uh, she said, uh, you know, I thought I, for a minute I thought I was going to get better with that remedy, but I'm absolutely no better today. I feel even worse. And I said, okay, hold on. There's a lot of noise in the background. Uh, I can't really hear you very well. What's, what's going on? She said, oh, it's just me. I'm cleaning out the pan cupboard. I said, you what? She said, I'm cleaning out the pan cupboard. I said, I thought you were really ill. I thought you were kind of like couldn't get out of bed. She said, well, there's only me here, she said. So I had to get up to make myself a hot drink. And I thought I would squeeze some lemon juice into a pan and boil it up. You know, it might help uh, my throat. She said, and then when I saw the state of the pan drawer, that David's obviously cooked himself a meal, that's her son, and he's gone off and left it. I, I just couldn't. I couldn't go back to bed without cleaning the pan drawer up. So that's what I could hear in the background. It was all the pans being taken out and washed and put back in while she had me on speakerphone. I said, oh, for goodness sake, take some arsenicum and ring me back tomorrow. So she took arsenicum 200. She phoned me back. She said... Spot on, she said. I took it, I went back to bed, I fell into a deep sleep, I woke up and I felt much better. And so that was it. Uh, even when they're ill, they thought of leaving something undone. Not why, you know, even when they feel so ill, sometimes they'll drag themselves to, to clean up. Or if they vomited, you know, a lot of remedies, if they felt really that ill, they might just do a rough job of it, go back to bed and die, and then the next morning they'll clean up properly but not an arsenicum. They could not do that. They will just have to. If there's no, obviously, if there's somebody there, they'll get somebody else to do it for them. But if they can't, they can't leave it. That, that need for cleanliness, order, uh, is very strong in them. And even when they're ill, they'll be like that. You know, they, their bedside table, anything that's on there, drinks or tablets or a bit of fruit, it'll, it'll, you know, it'll be like a still life painting. <laughs> because that's a particular feeling. Uh, when the symptoms agree, it may be useful for asthma. It's an asthmatic remedy. It, we mentioned it, I think, for colds, where there's the clear runny nose, the chill, the restlessness. Uh, and generally, it can also be a remedy for, uh, for allergies. The next remedy, China. Uh, China, if you remember, is homeopathic clay prepared quinine. It's the bark of uh, the China officinalis tree. And so, again, we said this is a remedy uh, dear to the hearts of many homeopaths because it's the first remedy that, uh, that Samuel Hahnemann discovered. And it's a wonderfully useful remedy. It's, uh, it has a number of aspects, but one of the biggest features of China is that it's really useful from dehyd in dehydration, and particularly dehydration after diarrhea and vomiting, or loss of blood sometimes, or loss of fluids through massive sweating. But in this one, there may be, if you've eaten something, particularly bad fruit, uh, then there can be diarrhea with very watery stools. Ah, sorry. The keynote for 
China is that the abdomen is very, very bloated, really bloated. The books say tympanic. That means it's like a drum. You could almost play a tune on it. It's so tight and bloated. So a tympanic abdomen, really, really bloated. And the patient will feel weak and they might be really dehydrated. In the absence of being able to get electrolytes or diorolite sachets or anything like that, uh, China uh, dropped in a bottle of water, sipped regularly, is an amazing remedy for actually helping balance the electrolytes and helping protect the body from the ill effects of dehydration and loss of fluids. So they may have severe diarrhea, very bloated, quite weak. They may have a bitter taste in the mouth. And they may be worse in the night. They may sometimes have to get up in the night to pass a stool. And they might be feverish. Remember that the reason that Samuel Hahnemann used this remedy first was because it's the main remedy for malari malarial fevers. And it is a remedy that we use for uh, people never been well since malaria or dehydration after really high fevers. So it's a, it's a big a remedy for dehydration, a remedy that we would often say take with you if you're traveling. Because when you're traveling to exotic places, one, you may be more likely uh, to get diarrhea and vomiting and a bit dehydrated and you may be more likely to get some sort of tropical fevers for which China is very useful for. But a really big remedy for helping with um, diarrhea and vomiting and especially when there's a, a lot of dehydration and fluid loss. Carbo veg. Vegetable charcoal. This is a remedy, they say, is very useful when the stomach has been disordered by bad fish. And the patient may feel very weak and they may collapse. They will feel very icy cold and the extremities might be very blue and very cold. Again, like China, the stomach may be really bloated with a lot of flatulence. You might say they feel that somebody's put a bicycle pump on their belly and just inflated it and they just feel really, really... But they know that it's wind and they want to pass wind but sometimes they just can't pass any wind. They feel better if they can. And they, because they've got a lot of pressure upwards in their stomach, it may make them even feel a little bit breathless and they like to be fanned. It looks very similar sometimes to a remedy called Veratrum Album. And Veratrum Album is a little bit like Arsenicum Album too, but more significantly cold uh, and blue. So this one also has that coldness and blueness. Veratrum Album isn't one of the ones that you'd buy over the counter. It's sometimes in travel kits because it's more likely to be, to be really severe diarrhea that you might get in traveling in exotic places, a bit like China, but China's a little bit more mainstream. But carbo veg, we know carbo veg for digestive things that people often say, have some charcoal because it helps uh, prevent wind and have some charcoal because it helps absorb toxins. So even in its crude state, it, it can uh, have a, a, a digestive aspect to it. Uh, but the, the sort of weakness, coldness and blueness of the desire to be fanned are the particular features of carbo veg. Sulfur. Sulfur is another of our constitutional remedies. Uh, it's a, a big remedy. Uh, and sulfur can be useful here um, when the stool is very, very loose and foul smelling. And the stool may smell of rotten eggs. I guess that sulfuric smell is a bit like rotten eggs and so that the stool may be sulfury, like old drains or like rotten eggs. When they have diarrhea, they are particularly bad in the morning. They need the toilet urgently. They may waken early 
and think, oh, I'm going to have to go five o'clock, six o'clock, I can't lie in, I've got to get up, I've got to go, because they have a very urgent need for a bowel movement at that time in the morning. And they may actually have a lot of itching at the back passage after passing a stool. The stool is usually painless. The typical sulphur patient is very hot. On a constitutional level, when we see a sulphur patient, uh, apart from being incredibly hot, you know, they're their body temperature runs really warm. People say they're like a radiator. They rarely need to put on any warm clothes. They could go out in the winter with a, you know, a vest on sometimes. They have such a, an incredible body heat. They're a very, very warm red remedy. And uh, I once heard a sulfur child describe a jumper as uh, something you have to wear when your mother's cold because <laughs> they just don't feel the cold. They're also a very untidy remedy, and a seriously untidy remedy. They're, they have a very marked sweet tooth. And the diarrhea symptoms of, of sulfur are often almost like they've had food poisoning, and they've recovered, but they haven't quite recovered. Their bowel has not kind of quite gone back to where it was. They feel okay. They're not vomiting anymore. They've got back their appetite. They're not dehydrated. They're, they're pretty much better, but they have this persistent diarrhea since the diarrhea and vomiting. And it's usually worse in the morning. And they may sometimes have to go three or four times in the morning, and then it's cleared for the day. But they'll say, I've just not quite got over the food poisoning I had or the virus that I had and I haven't quite been able to get rid of the diarrhea. So we may use it in the acute phase if the stool is very, very foul, watery, uh, painless and eggy. But we may also use it for the after effects of somebody who has never really been well since they had the diarrhea and their bowel is, is, is loose and uh, profuse in the morning. When the symptoms agree, sulfur is very useful. It's one of the remedies uh, that we use a lot for skin problems. Uh, it's one of our big eczema remedies if the symptoms fit. We're again looking for that hot, untidy um, uh, person who is, uh, has a lot of skin disturbances. They tend to be a little on the lazy side and very in their own head. Uh, so it's a common constitutional remedy and very useful for skin problems when the symptoms agree. Previous useful remedy alert. Remember Nux vomica? We said that it's good when there's a lot of nausea and vomiting and ailments from overindulgence in rich food or alcohol. So they may have diarrhea or vomiting because they've just really overdone it. They ate too much, they drank too much, their body's just gone, you know what, there's and that's enough, <laughs> and they've had a clear out. So they have uh, diarrhea and vomiting and they have uh, nausea with it, they're irritable, and they're chilly. So it's a very good digestive remedy generally, as we mentioned before. So don't forget about NUX, especially if, if there's a lot of vomiting and a lot of nausea. Most often, in a different situation, NUX vomic is a constipated remedy. But when their system is really overloaded and they've drank too much, eaten too much, uh, and, you know, eaten beyond the capacity of their digestion, then they may actually, their body may just want to clear everything out. And in that situation, they may have vomiting and diarrhea.
next topic burns our orthodox first aid stop the burn getting any worse by moving the casualty away from the source of heat cool the burn as quickly as possible run it under cool water for at least 10 minutes or until the pain feels better don't use ice j creams or gels they may damage the tissues assess how bad the burn is it is serious if it is larger than the size of the casualty's hand uh, whether it, and or if it's on the face, hands or feet or if it's a deep burn. In any of these situations, seek help. Meanwhile, remove any jewellery or clothing that is near to the burn, unless it's stuck to it, in which case just leave it. Cover the burned area with kitchen cling film or some other clean non-fluffy material like a clean plastic bag prevents infection and stops anything sticking to it and if you're unsure if any burn is serious tell the patient to see a doctor um, most burns that are happen in the house as long as they don't cover too large an area can be comfortably dealt with at home um, the rule of the size of your palm is very appropriate for children and it has to be the size of the child's palm not your palm but if the size of the burn on the child is bigger than the child's palm then they definitely need to see um, medical attention if it's your own body and it's about the size of your palm or slightly bigger if it's a scald and it isn't too deep or too severe you're probably still okay to treat that at home but just use caution if it's really blistered if it's significantly larger than your palm, then seek help. With large burns, we lose fluid as well through our skin. Um, the rule for adults in some, uh, for, on some uh, sites for acute uh, uh, problems says it's the rule of nines, which is if it's a ninth part of your body, which is actually about the surface of half of an arm. But... That's quite a big burn. I, I would, I, I think the, the the palm is a reasonably good, uh, a reasonably good idea if it's a big burn, and especially if it's blistered. But even if it's a small burn, if it's very deep or very nasty, always it's good to get them dressed professionally because they're really painful. The remedies can do their good job anyway. It doesn't hurt to let a professional look at it and dress it appropriately. Uh, I, I would say that's. Uh, pretty good idea. So remedies, urtica urines. Homeopathic remedies for burns, I have to say, are really amazing. They really do make a difference. I would always cool the burn, uh, not cold water, you know, tepid water, cooler than the burn. Uh, and I start, start giving the remedies immediately. And there's two main remedies we're going to talk about. The first one is this one, urtica urines, which as you can see from that picture is stinging nettle. Urtica urines is a remedy for minor burns. First degree burns, meaning the skin will be red and hot, but it won't be broken or blistered. It might, however, itch. So there might be itching accompanying uh, the burn. It's particularly a useful remedy when there are burns from scalds. You know, scalds means a hot, hot fluid. And unusually, the patient will want something warm applied, which is reasonably homeopathic. But if they want something warm applied, make sure it's not too warm, but just warm enough to make them feel uh, that they get relief from it. You can immediately give this remedy or the next remedy we're going to, to talk about and you can give it really frequently until the burn is more comfortable and you may want to seek help to have it dressed as I said if it's a nasty burn. When the symptoms agree urtica could be useful for urticaria and other allergic reactions. Urticaria is nettle rash uh, allergic reactions. Sometimes people develop urticaria which are like wheels, white uh, raised areas on the skin, very very itchy 
and they may get that after they've eaten something that they are uh, sensitive to. It looks like a large nettle rash. You know how when you fall into nettles, you get the little white areas on the background of the red skin and they kind of sting and then they itch. And that's how urticaria is, uncomfortable, stingy and itchy. Uh, and usually as a part of an allergic reaction. And urtica urines is very good for urticaria, as you can uh, imagine. As, uh, uh, urticaria is known as nettle rash, although it isn't always caused by nettles. And urtica urines comes from a nettle. So useful for allergic reactions, but very useful for, for burns. Cantharis. One of our animal remedies, made from uh, a beetle. And the beetle, Cantharis, is sometimes better known as Spanish fly. And Spanish fly, or Cantharis, is a fantastic remedy for burns. This can treat a slightly more serious burn. I don't mean, you know, a major, major burn. But if urtica urines is really a first degree burn, cantharis can have a more significant burn with blistering and breaking of the skin. So there might be blistering. There might be swelling. And the burn will be extremely painful, extremely painful burning and smarting and they will feel much better for a cold application they will want it as cold as they can they will they will be wanting the St John's ambulance uh, uh, ice cubes in a tea towel that's what they will want and as, as long as the ice cubes in the tea towel are applied to the burn they will feel relief as soon as you take it away they'll say oh can I have that back again it really starts to sting as soon as they take the cold away it's really relieved as soon as they put the cold back again if you want to for a burn and you're not sure you can combine the two you could get an urtica urines you could get a cantharis you could put them both in a bottle of water and you could sip it regularly whilst keeping the the burn cooled they say don't use ointments and things in the St. John's uh, Guide, but that's until the wound is either seen by a medical professional if it's a severe wound, or at least until the wound has been really cooled. But for a, a first degree uh, burn where the skin is very red and hot, once you've cooled it, you can get some fantastic burn ointments. And as long as the burn has been cooled or isn't requiring further dressing from a medical professional, it's quite all right then to use burn ointments, which can really speed up the rate at which the burn becomes more comfortable and heals and stops it from scarring so readily. When the symptoms agree, cantharis is our number one remedy for cystitis. If any people here have ever suffered from cystitis, uh, get to know this remedy because it is like a miracle. It's not the only remedy for cystitis but it's a bit like one of the other remedies we talked about earlier when we said it's not the only remedy but 8 out of 10, I think it was rust tox and chicken pox and we said 8 out of 10 cases will respond to it. It's like that with cantharis and cystitis. 8 out of 10 people will respond to cantharis Maybe two out of ten will need a different remedy. But it's such a big remedy for irritation of the urethra. You know, Spanish fly is best known as, before the advent of Viagra, it was where people would turn to if they wanted an aphrodisiac uh, because it helps uh, increase the libido and it helps erections. However, it's enormously aggravating to the urethra. So the outcome uh, is it's a, a Faustian pact that you've entered into there. Is the pain worth the pleasure? Because it can cause severe irritation for days. Pain and burning on passing water. Uh, really, really acute. So uh, what it causes uh, in its crude form, which is irritation of the urethra, it can heal in its homeopathic form. Therefore, it's one of our biggest remedies for cystitis. 
and at the first sign of an irritable bladder where you think, oh, oh, I think I'm getting cystitis, I've been for a pee, I'm back, I need to go again, it's slightly uncomfortable, a dose of cantharis, a big glass of water, job done, almost always. It's quite an amazing remedy for cystitis. Coming back to burns, which is uh, really what we're talking about, the um, urtica urines and cantharis are also very good for sunburn. They will really calm down. If somebody has a, a, a really nasty sunburn, maybe they fell asleep in the sun, hadn't remembered uh, to set a clock or something, and they've woken up and their back is like brilliant, brilliant red, uh, then uh, lying in a cool bath uh, for quite a while, drinking plenty of fluids, you might want to add belladonna. You could have a bottle of water with urtica cantharis and belladonna in it and sip that throughout the uh, afternoon, evening and the next day. It again is quite miraculous. Keep the burn cool. If you get out of the cool bath uh, to go and have some dinner or go for it, get back in it when you come in, keep, your, keep that cool, keep your fluids up and keep taking that combination of remedies. You can, if you want to be more classical, try to work out which is the remedy that you're most likely to need. If you think, well, I really can't tell, just bung one of each of them in and, and sip that. It's a very good combination for severe sunburn. Obviously, we need to try and avoid the sunburn, if at all possible. It's not healthy to be burned by the sun. So we need to try and limit our sun exposure and go into the shade or put clothes on. Uh, but with the best will in the world, it happens to everyone occasionally. And it's good to have some remedies uh, at hand to know what to do because sunburn can really be quite unpleasant uh, and it's not taken as seriously as a, a, a burn from a, a hot liquid or something but it can actually be almost like a, a grade one burn. Causticum. This isn't so much a remedy that we're going to use for an acute burn but it's a remedy we might use for somebody who has recovered from a more serious burn. Maybe the burn was a really bad burn, maybe it was a third degree burn, uh, maybe it required hospital treatment. And although the patient has recovered from the burn physically, they may never have felt the same. So it's a bit like the patient with the diarrhea who needed the sulfur, because although the diarrhea is, the, the ailment itself has gone, they've never really fully recovered. So this one, if somebody has, we say NBWS, never been well since, if somebody has never been well since a severe burn, we might consider a dose of causticum. Also, if it's a family member and they're in hospital and they're being dealt with and they're having their burns dressed and they're maybe on drips and they're being looked after, as soon as you can, you can give them this remedy. Again, remedies will never uh, interfere with or cut across or be any problem in it, it will never be a problem uh, alongside of what they're being given conventionally so there's no harm in giving the cost to come in that situation while the patient is still in hospital and again if it's easier you can pop one in their water jug and they can just sip it every so often. So causticum for more severe burns where you may actually be visiting the person whilst they're recovering in hospital or from people who've had a severe burn but just don't feel right uh, anymore afterwards uh, we, can, uh, we can consider causticum. Uh, previous useful uh, remedy alert Calendula. We talked about calendula and how useful it can be topically uh, as well as internally for sore skin. Um, so you can take this internally or you can apply it uh, as ointment after uh, things have started healing. It might help prevent scarring. It might help to uh, make the skin heal up more quickly. Also remember arnica and aconite, if there is a degree of shock or fright, and quite often with a nasty burn, somebody may be quite shocked if they've pulled a hot pan of water on their foot or something. You might want to give these remedies first. If you're going to be calling for medical assistance, give those, prepare your burn remedies, and they can have the burn remedies a little bit later uh, once they've 
uh, once they've had the burn looked at, assessed and dressed. Look at this fella. This is Drosera. I love uh, the look of Drosera. It's such, you know, I, I used to, it's an interesting plant for a number of reasons. One, it's one of our very few insectivorous plants. It's native to the British Isles. I don't think we use any other insectivorous plants in homeopathy that I can think of. And it looks like it's come from Mars. It's such a bizarre looking, and I used to see pictures of this when I looked at Drosera, and I always thought it was probably quite a big plant, but it's tiny. The, it's about the size of your thumbnail, and it's bright green, but it's fringed with this red spikiness, which produces this sticky dew, which catches the sun. Its common name is sundew. So it's green with this bright, bright red with this sparkling stickiness on it. And it honestly, it looks like something out of Day of the Triffids or something. It, it doesn't look like it should grow on, on Earth. But it's actually really beautiful. And it's a remedy called Drosera. And Drosera is one of our big cough remedies. Drosera has a cough as soon as the head touches the pillow, a deep paroxysmal spasmodic cough, where one attack follows the other, follows the other, you think they're not going to be able to get their breath in. They may cough, 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 cough and vomit. They may reach or vomit after the cough. They may cough more midnight to two o'clock in the morning. They may have an irritation in their throat that keeps prompting them to cough. And they may bring up uh, some uh, mucus, expectorations, bringing up some mucus from the chest, which may have a slightly salty flavor. The cold sweat might accompany the cough. And they might cough so much that it triggers nosebleeds. They'll cough more on talking. They'll cough more on eating. But it's this hoarse, deep paroxysms of cough where they'll start and they just can't stop. And if they're cough, 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 
then they may <gasps> because they haven't been able to get their breath in and this may be a useful remedy for whooping cough which has that typical type of cough a paroxysmal cough that may result in reaching or bringing up of ropey mucus and it may also end in the cough 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 and the parents are willing the child to take another breath they're getting red in the face and eventually they <gasps> In. So it's one of our big remedies for helping to treat whooping cough. But any severe cough and its keynote, as we said in the last slide, is as soon as the head touches the pillow at night. They may not have coughed very much in the day. Head on the pillow, they're off. And it's a really uh, significant cough with, uh, with a lot of irritation and maybe reaching and vomiting. The next uh, cough remedy is pulsatilla. We talked a little bit about pulsatilla when we talked about colds and we said that it um, was a remedy for a, a cold that had got a lot of green uh, mucus. Uh, so pulsatilla, the typical pulsatilla patient, it's a big remedy for children, big children's remedy, not to say that adults won't need pulsatilla from time to time. The cough may be changeable like the patient in general. Pulsatilla is very well known for its changeability and its symptoms and its mood. So a child, you know how sometimes children, they're laughing one minute, crying the next, and they're crying and then you'll tickle them and then they're laughing again, you know. It has that malleability uh, to the emotions and that changeability. And most of the complaints that Pulsatilla has may be changeable. If they had a stomach upset and you said, what is your stool like, they'd say, oh, it could be like anything, it's really changeable. Yesterday I felt constipated, today my stool's been loose. Everything is changeable. So their cough might be changeable. So for instance, they might have a, a dry cough at night and a loose cough in the day. Most complaints of pulsatilla are associated with the production of a lot of green mucus maybe from the nose, maybe from the chest. They may cough up green mucus, they may blow out green mucus from their nose. But they're a mucusy remedy. Uh, and they're often little children, especially, who get lots of colds. And when they get colds, they're just a, a snot factory. <laughs> and they have green mucus. They even can have it in the conjunctivitis in their eyes. But a lot of coughing. Colds often go to their chest. And they have a rattly chest and they may bring up some green mucus. What about yellow? Yeah, yellowish or yellowish green. Yeah, they could be yellowish. Uh, sometimes those are kind of quite hard to differentiate, aren't they? But definitely a yellowish green. Pulsatilla are always worse in a warm room. So they will cough much more when the room is really warm or stuffy. And they will cough much less if they're out in the fresh air. Same when they have a runny nose. They will be able to breathe when they're out in the fresh air, whereas when they're in, uh, in a stuffy room, their nose will be completely obstructed and it will be very difficult for them to breathe. So much, much better for fresh open air and much, much worse for whatever their problem is. And Pulsatil is another of these quite big remedies, covers quite a lot of things, but they're definitely always better when they're cool. They are also a very tearful remedy. We talked about them having the cold and we said that they're not only tearful, they like a lot of consolation and comfort. They're, mummy, rub my neck. You know, mummy, bring me an extra blanket. Mummy, come and cuddle me. They want lots of fuss and attention. And even adults who require pulsatilla will be looking to be looked after a little bit. You know, a cup of tea would be good, you know. Oh, could you put the pillow a little bit higher? They like to be fussed over. It makes them feel loved and secure, and it makes them feel a bit better. So pulsatilla, when they're unwell, uh, if you remember, what was the remedy that we said that didn't like consolation? Natremure. They're the independent ones who, when they're unwell, say, just leave me be, I'll get over it. Pulsatilla are the ones who want the fuss and the attention. And very often, easily tearful. They feel a bit sorry for themselves. This is a very common children's remedy. Really common. Uh, when children are ill, uh, if they're not responding to one of the uh, real acute inflammatory remedies like the aconite, belladonna, chamomilla, uh, they may then respond to the slightly more catarrhal remedies and pulsatilla is one of those. So tearful. And they're also quite thirstless. 
They don't drink very much fluid uh, and they may need to be, rem rem to be reminded to drink. Uh, you know, they may be a bit like a camel. They'll drink one drink in the morning and they may not need to drink again until uh, they're home. And the mum say, how much have you drank today? Let me have a look at your water bottle. They find that it's not been touched. Next remedy, Ipecac. Ipecac is also a cough like Drosera that may uh, end with reaching and vomiting. It's also quite a, the word they use is a suffocative cough, where you, again you really feel like they're not going to be able to get their breath in. One of the features uh, of Ipecac is that the child will stiffen out with the cough, or the, doesn't have to be a child, could be an adult, they kind of go stiff when they cough. You know, when, with Ipecac, we also use Ipecac for colic, and one of the keynotes of it for colic for babies is the same, it's stiffening. You know, if babies have colic, sometimes they bring their knees up to their chest. This one, they like a little plank, you know, you could hold them on one finger almost, because they're like a little plank, their legs go out, their arms go out, and they, they stiffen out, and they stiffen when they're in pain. So when they have a cough, Ipecac can go stiff as well. Might be that their arms will go back like that as they cough but their, their body takes a, a sort of stiff posture. And when they cough, they cough, 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 and they may vomit also. They cough till they're really quite blue in the face. They have a lot of rattling in their chest. You'll hear a, a lot of rattling, and more rattling than actually comes up. And they also may have a nosebleed with a cough. They have a, a tightness around their chest, a sense of constriction around their chest. And they may be slightly wheezy. It's a slightly wheezy cough. They often don't want to eat very much. The old Materia Medica say desires dainties, which really means little things, little nice things, maybe sweet, but they don't have very much of an appetite. They go off their food when they're ill. But the keynotes are this sort of stiffening out, going slightly blue around the lips when they cough, the rattling, uh, the rattling in the chest and the, the ending with the vomiting. Calc carb. Calc carb is uh, the shell of an oyster, made from the shell of an oyster. And again, this is quite a big remedy. It's quite a big constitutional remedy. And it's useful to know a little bit about, this is a very often a baby's remedy. I say that, it's also very often adults' remedies too. Uh, but it's a, they ha, this, pa this patient has a tendency to catch colds frequently. They may have three, four, even five colds in a year. And they may go to their chest. And the patient may not be terribly unwell, but like sulfur not being able to shake the diarrhea, calc carb may not quite be able to shake the cough. They might be out of breath going upstairs or walking up an incline. They may say, I could walk miles on the flat, but give me an incline and I've got to sit down every two minutes. They just don't do hills well. And they cough when they breathe in. They might feel like there's a, a feather in their throat, there's a tickle in their larynx. So it's that kind of cold, they've, they've had a cold, they've had a cough, they're better, but they're still coughing and they're still slightly breathless. They just don't seem to have quite regained their lung capacity. And that particularly notice going upstairs, going up a hill and coughing. It's a very often used remedy for chubby babies who have tendency to coughs. The typical calc carb patient has very easy perspiration that might smell slightly sour and they usually have a strong desire for eggs they love eggs doesn't matter whether they're boiled fried poached scrambled they just love them and when the symptoms agree calc carb might be useful for nightmares difficult dentition and cramp Previous useful remedy alert. Do you remember bryonia? And we said about bryonia for headaches, and we said that the main thing about bryonia is that they're worse for any motion. And that if they had a headache, 
it may be worse when they cough and when they have a cough they may because they are worse from movement the cough is kind of makes their chest move and sometimes they have painful chest muscles when they cough so they may actually hold on to their chest when they're coughing or hold on to their head when they're coughing because the movement uh, of their chest when they cough will actually hurt their chest or make their headache they want to be completely still and when sometimes if their chest is sore when they feel a cough coming on they go oh no I don't want to cough it's going to hurt my chest uh, the cough is going to be dry remember we said dryonia anything to do with bryonia is going to be dry so it's going to be a dry cough quite a painful cough make the chest sore maybe even pleurisy where there's dryness of the pleural membranes and it's really painful to cough sharp stabby pains they're worse for movement they're thirsty and they're irritable previous useful remedy alert aconite remember the aconite complaints they come on suddenly the cough is likely to be croupy comes on after exposure to cold cold wind or being chilled and they may be feverish anxious and restless so are you getting the idea now that if you know the keynotes of the remedies and you know roughly what things it's going to be good for it becomes much easier to find a way of differentiating one remedy from the other there's a lot of information here you're going to have a chance to go over it and review it uh, by watching the uh, the film uh, whenever you want or going to specific areas of the film to recap on the cough remedies this is only a um, an introduction there are many many cough remedies but what we're trying to do is go through the remedies that are typically available in a health food shop that you can go and get for yourself and treat people with at home and hopefully it's whetting your appetite for for further learning because it's such a fascinating subject we're going to uh, finish today with acute emotional issues we've got some interesting remedies to cover here uh, and we're going to do uh, four or five remedies uh, for, for this last uh, section but just remember that the remedies are the catalyst for helping the patient to access their own ability to recover and that the remedies they're not prescribed for the complaint as much as for the the symptoms uh, that need to match but the symptoms that come up for belladonna the belladonna symptoms could come up we've seen this we've seen it could come up in fever we've seen it could be headache we've seen it could be a finger infection or a sore throat uh, we we've seen the the aconite and we're not actually finished with aconite yet we're going to recap it one more time uh, so it's interesting to see that this is unusual this is not what happens in orthodox medicine that one drug covers all these different uh, things uh, so it's quite different and it takes a little bit of getting your head around because it's not as simple as this is the remedy for this you know we if we were doctors we say right you've got uh, stomach acid and gastritis we give you a meprazole that's the remedy for that which is kind of often how it is there may be one or two choices but basically that's what a meprazole does and it doesn't do anything else whereas we have a, a remedy that can actually deal with quite a lot of different things but as long as the symptoms of the remedy match some of the keynotes of your complaint you're going to find a remedy that's going to help your body to throw off the disease so it's a, a very different way of looking at things
So we're going to look at some acute emotional issues here uh, and some of the remedies that are available over the counter for dealing not with physical trauma and physical ailments, but some of the emotional things that we might need help with acutely. We might decide that if the problem doesn't go away, we need to seek help from a more qualified professional, um, either orthodox or homeopathic. But the first remedy we're going to look at is Ignatia. Ignatia, St. Ignatius Bean is the, is the remedy, and Ignatia is it's a brilliant remedy. And the main thing that we are going to use Ignatia for is grief. It's the number one remedy for, uh, for people who have lost someone dear to them. It helps the patient to, to feel strong enough to work through the grieving process. It's not suppressive. It doesn't stop them grieving. Grieving is a process that has to be got through. And there's no prescriptive time. You should be over it by now. You should be better by now. You're not still, you know, I think people who are grieving find that really hard that they can't talk to a friend anymore because the friend thinks, oh Christ, you're not over that yet. And if you've lost someone dear to you, it may take a long, long time before you really re regain your equilibrium and learn to live without that person in your life. So Ignatia is an enormously powerful remedy for helping people through grief. And as I say, it isn't suppressing, it's helping the processing of the grief. It may also be useful from ailments from grief. We might find that you've lost someone dear and now you keep getting headaches or insomnia. You can't sleep anymore. You're going over and over things at night time. Or you get a dry, troublesome, tickly, emotional cough that just won't go away. As well as ailments from grief, which is its main feature, there is a tendency to hysteria. It may be slightly odd remedy because it can also be really quiet in the face of grief and not let you see how upset they are. But by turns they can go absolutely hysterical and be really over the top with their emotions, very, very dramatic. Aside from grief, it's also a remedy for a slightly lesser type of grief, which is a severe disappointment. A, a disappointment that might be maybe being passed over for a, a, an important promotion, something that you really felt was yours and something that you almost felt you had. And then they say, we're really sorry, you were in the top three, but we've given the job to someone else and crash, your world collapses around you. All your dreams are, 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 are gone and you find it very hard to cope with it. Also, um, grief may come not just from uh, somebody uh, who has died, but from disappointments in love. Somebody who you loved who says they no longer love you. These are all ailments that Ignatia can help to, uh, to sustain us whilst we adapt. We, we know that the process is that we do have to adapt to this different life that we have now. And uh, Ignatia can help us uh, and to sustain us while we adapt. Sometimes this, the kind of hysterical thing can sometimes be that we, we bring the, the, it, into our body. So that, for instance, something that I see quite a lot Patients will come to see me and I'll say, what can I do for you? And they'll say, I have a lump in my throat. And I'll say, what kind of lump? Well, I don't know. I went to the doctor because I thought maybe it was a tumour. And he looked and he couldn't see anything, but he sent me to the hospital and they sent a camera down and they can't see anything. And they've said it's probably a globus hystericus. A globus hystericus is what you're described with when you feel like you've got a big boiled sweet stuck in your throat and it's very uncomfortable, you can't get rid of it. But when your throat is examined with a, a flexible camera, there's just nothing there. Uh, in Chinese medicine, they call it plumstone chi. They say it's a ball of grief stuck in your throat. And the main remedy for that, homeopathically, is Ignatia. And that's almost a sort of hysterical symptom, if you like, that your, your body has, has pushed this uh, symptom in, in, into, a, somatized it into your body. Ignatia generally, they're a very sensitive, emotional and idealistic remedy. If we're too idealistic, we actually open ourselves up to that disappointment that Ignatia is so good at dealing with. 
And when somebody is in an Ignatius state, they may have a lot of sighing. You may notice that the patient who needs Ignatia, when you say, how are you feeling today? They may go, oh, well, you know, so, yes, I'm just getting through every day. But there's a lot of sighing, a bit, as if they're not getting enough oxygen in and they need to take in more air by sighing. And yawning is another feature of this remedy. They may yawn. Something else they may get is hiccups. They're worse for consolation, they're worse for tobacco smoke, and they're worse for coffee. If they have headaches, they're again small spot headaches, like the thuya, like a nail being driven in. And we mentioned they may have a dry, tickling cough or a lump in the throat after suppressed emotions or grief that they've not really worked through. But it's a fantastic remedy, Ignatia. Uh, so at its most extreme, it's for grief, uh, loss of a loved one, lesser for disappointment, just for times when you feel a little bit overwhelmed. I say that to patients sometimes, you know, they may be getting through a grief and they may say, I think I'm okay now. And I'll say, well, just keep that Ignatia. And any time you feel overwhelmed, where you can't cope with your emotions, where your cup is full and you just feel I can't, cope anymore I've got too much and you know it just feels life feels overwhelming just take an Ignatia it brings you back to a place of yeah all of those things are still there we can't take them away sadly but we can take you back to actually there's a bit more room in the cup than I thought I can cope I will be okay so it's a fantastic remedy for emotional uh, acute emotional trauma and uh, Ignatia can help to get you through if after some time of Ignatia, it's not getting you through, that's when you may need to consult a professional homeopath to see whether there's another remedy that might fit you uh, better and, and help move you on further. Next remedy, Argentum nitricum. Argentum nitricum is nitrate of silver. Some of the features of Argenit it's a very anxious remedy. Uh, anticipation, apprehension and fear. They have a lot of uh, very strong anxiety and they may have a tendency to panic attacks. Especially when they feel a bit claustrophobic, where they feel they can't get out easily. So on an aeroplane, they'll be sat there, they'll be sat there, they'll be trying to control themselves, trying to control themselves the plane doors will close and they'll be, stop, stop, I need to get off. Uh, they just suddenly feel overwhelmed by panic when they feel st closed in. If they go to the theatre, if they go to uh, a show of some sort, they'll choose the outside row so that they feel if they need to get out quick, they can get out quick. They don't have to say, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, and disrupt everyone. They can just go. They hate to feel hemmed in or claustrophobic. They may not like to travel in, in tube trains for the same reason as the, as the aeroplane. Even in a dentist chair, they feel pinned down, stuck. So they're a big remedy for anxiety, huge anxiety remedy. And they are particularly good for that anticipation, stress before ordeals or exams. Uh, and sometimes with panic attacks, as the panic attack uh, heightens, they actually fear that they're going to go crazy, that they're just their brain's going to explode, they're going to scream, they're never going to come back to normal. Uh, panic attacks are really horrible things. And mostly if people get severe panic attacks, it, it is something they're going to need usually to consult a homeopath about to really get rid of them uh, all of the time to, you know, to, to deal with all the underlying issues. But acutely, when people suddenly feel really afraid, if they have an ordeal that they think, am I going to be okay in this ordeal? Will I be able to hold it together? A dose of Arginet really helps you hold it together uh, and helps to keep you calm. If you have a fear of flying, not as drastic as I'm going to leap out when the doors close, but if you find it really, really uncomfortable and the whole time you're gripping your, oh, taking some uh, Arginet uh, and repeating it every few hours can really help you get through a flight. 
When people come to see me for panic attacks, sometimes it helps to explain that, uh, what a panic attack is because either with arginate, their fear is that they're going to go mad. With aconite, their fear is that they're going to have a heart attack or a stroke. They often end up at A&E. Uh, and I always say, look, all that's happening is your body has produced too much adrenaline. You're not going to die. You're not going to go mad. Nothing bad can happen to you from a panic attack. It just feels wretched, but it won't last for long and it will slowly come back down. And if you can self-soothe, if you can say to yourself, remember what Hillary said, I'm not going mad. It's only that I've had a big burst of adrenaline into my system that's making me feel like this. The more you go, oh my God, oh my God, I'm having a panic attack, I'm going to have a heart attack. The more you do that, the longer it lasts. If you can kind of get a grip of it, self-soothe and say, Hillary's told me I'm not going to go mad, I'm not going to have a heart attack, I'm going to be fine, she's given me this little bottle of remedies, I'm going to pop one under my tongue and I'm going to sit here and I'm going to breathe in and out slowly until it passes. And once they've done that, once they've had a remedy and it's passed, they feel so much more in control of the panic attacks that that may be an end to it because they actually don't feel overwhelmed by it anymore. So arginate is a wonderful remedy uh, for anxiety and panic and helping, again, a bit like the Ignatia, putting you back in control and just helping you to deal with the situation. It's not the only remedy and that's why I say if it's not the right remedy and it doesn't do enough then you need to go and see a homeopath because we have some other brilliant remedies for panic attacks. But arginate is a great remedy for acute anxiety uh, and particularly when there's an ordeal that you're going to go through and you feel that it might make you panic and that you might be saying to the dentist get out of my way I'm, I've got to leave. It just helps you to say no I'm okay and this needs to be done and I can put up with this. It's a great remedy. The, the, the arginate remedy tend to be an impulsive person anyway and easily agitated. They're often hurried and quite anxious in their, in, in their general way of being. They have a fear of heights and sometimes their fear of heights is a fear that they're going to be sort of drawn towards the edge. They look down and they kind of feel they're almost being drawn towards it. With their anxiety they may also have diarrhea from anxiety. They are also a remedy that tend to have a lot of bloating and flatulence. Again, they're one of our remedies that tend to say, I start the day with a flat stomach, I end up the day looking pregnant. And they have a strong desire for sweet foods. And it's a, a, a really, really great remedy for helping to soothe and calm that real agitation that threatens to build up into a real panic attack. Just takes the edge off of that and helps the person to calm. Our next remedy is cocculus. Cocculus is a, a, a very useful remedy in a lot of situations, but I guess our main thing that we're going to use cocculus for is emotional complaints that get on top of us when we've not been able to sleep, when we've had uh, a loss of sleep for any reason. It could be maybe jet lag. This is a remedy that we might use for jet lag. It may be caused by grief or anxiety. Most often, cocculus is, has sleeplessness and problems that are caused by looking after somebody else and being tired out by constantly listening out for somebody who's sick. This often happens to new mums. They have a new baby and they feel this terrible responsibility and whilst there's nothing wrong with their baby, they see this fragile little bundle and they're thinking at night, is he still breathing, you know, and oh, was that a cough I heard, you know, why is he not coughing, you know, so if, if they're crying, they must be dying, if they're quiet, they must be dead, <laughs> you know, it's that, there's nothing that actually makes you, makes you happy uh, and you're always getting up and looking at them and, and jumping at the slightest sniffle and you know, you mean, people say, oh God, I'm, I'm so sleep deprived and then they get sleep deprived and they slow down and they they just feel really really tired and 
People who need coculus sometimes get obsessed with the amount of sleep they're getting. These are your people who always buy Fitbits and are checking how many hours sleep they got. You know, oh, I slept between three and five. That means I had five hours sleep. Well, that's not too bad. I can probably manage on five hours. I'll go early tonight and I'll try and get more hours sleep tonight. It starts to obsess them. They know they're chronically sleep deprived. And they think all the time about how much sleep am I going to get? What does the Fitbit say? You know, their, their own body can tell them how much they slept, but no, they rely on a Fitbit. So a gradual sleep de deficit that causes the person to slow down and become very kind of... Uh, now here's an example of, of, of a, a, a coculus that's slowing down and forgetfulness. One of my patients, he said to me, I've just been to see my dad, he said... I know he's not one of your patients. He said, is there anything you could give me for him? He said, he said it's driving me absolutely mental. He said, I, I need something. Uh, and I said, what's happened? He said, well, you know, my mum, his mum had died last year. He said, well, you know, my dad, he looked after her while she was sick. You know, he nursed her at home and he looked after her all of that time. And since she died, he's just not really been the same. And... We go, I go around to see him and we have these conversations uh, like, and he described to me, he said, I'll, I'll say, I'll be around tomorrow, Dad, do you want anything? Then I'll say, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, he clicks his fingers all the time. The yellow stuff, some of that yellow stuff. And my patient Colin would say, what yellow stuff, Dad? What's the yellow stuff? You know that yellow stuff, yellow stuff. Your mum used to love it, the yellow stuff. Oh, the old man makes it, old fella makes it, the yellow stuff. He goes through, he said, it's like, you know, two syllables, you know. <laughs> I don't know, Dad, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, it ended up being Mr. Kipling cake. <laughs> and the old fellow was the adverts of Mr. Kipling or something. And then he, uh, something else that he, he asked for. And he said, put it on the thing, the thing, put it on the thing in the corner. And he's shouting, what thing, Dad, what thing in the corner? You know the thing, the, the thing in the corner, bloody Richard and Judy are on it, or the television, okay. He said, it's driving me absolutely crazy. He said, he just seems suddenly... So I thought about it and I, you know, I said, you know, he nursed your mum a lot and we talked about that and how much he'd been up in the night with her in the last stages and how grieving he was now. And I said, well, look, why don't we try some coculus? It's the main remedy for night watching, they call it, looking after a person who's ill to your detriment, where you're worrying yourself sick about them all the time, where you may not be getting enough sleep. Uh, and then, of course, on top of that, it's a grief remedy and this slowed down forgetfulness. And I said, give him some of this coculus just every day for a few days and report back to me. And when he reported back to me, he said, he's much, much better. He said, I'm so grateful. He said, I, I don't know how much more I could have put up with that. <laughs> so, so it's a fantastic remedy for sleep deficit. As I say, it could be a new baby, could be somebody who's very ill that you're worrying over, could be jet lag at any time where you're not getting your sleep and you're really quite exhausted. Califosforicum. This is one of our remedies that uh, is sometimes used in a group of remedies called tissue salts. We're not going to go through tissue salts today, but they're, they're a useful group of remedies, usually given at a much lower uh, potency, almost at a more nutritional level. But Califos is also a normal remedy that we might give in the same way in 630, 200. And the main things that we are going to use uh, Califosforicum for is for nervous tension. They feel nervous, they feel tense, and they feel exhausted. And usually it's from overwork, too much mental strain, They've overworked and they've exhausted themselves. I often give this to uh, students. They've got really important exams coming up. They've got a lot riding on them. They become tense and nervous. They overwork themselves. And they get to a point where they kind of reach burnout. They have sort of brain fag. Nothing sticks in the memory. And a bit of Califos helps them regain that mental energy. They become anxious, they're nervous, they can't switch off and they may even get headaches. So Califos is a great remedy when people, even businessmen, you know sometimes that they, there's there's been a lot of uh, strain, no let up, some again something really important riding on the outcome and you're putting every minute of your thought into trying to solve it. 
either trying to study to get your A star or trying to sort this business problem out. It could be almost anything, but it's something that is taking up a lot of your mental energy. Not so much worry, but focus, more the focus. Uh, and that you just think, do you know, my brain is just going to uh, stop. I can't, I just can't keep doing this anymore. And they become exhausted. So students studying, businessmen who've got great big important uh, merger on or something like that. And they're just tired out by that strength of their focus. And they start to think, uh, they get headaches, they become forgetful. They may not sleep well. And a dose of Califos, again, it just helps it's like arnica for a tired brain. It's great. Previous useful remedy alert. Gelsemium. So for gelsemium, remember we talked about it for ailments from fright, ailments from bad news. It's also an ailments from anticipation, but it's slightly different from arginet. Although it has ailments from anticipation and ailments from ordeals, they don't kind of get that kind of agitated, panicky state. They, they will get very anxious, but they will, they will feel paralyzed by fear sometimes. They will run away from an ordeal. They won't go to the doctors. They'll miss their dental appointments. They won't do it. Uh, they say that gelsemium used to be given to soldiers to make them braver on the battlefield. I don't know whether that's true, but it means that they, you know, if you give someone gelsemium, they'll go to the dentist, they'll do what they need to do. So they shake. They're so afraid that they're shaking and trembling. When somebody has something to do, maybe they're going for the driving test, and uh, you say, do you want a, a, a gelsemium? They'll take the bottle and they go, thanks. You know, it's hard for them to... to to manage to take the remedy because they shake so much. It's a very trembly remedy and they feel weak and that their legs might give way. They sometimes can feel paralysed with fear. You know, I, um, I learned to ski. Ha, I use that loosely. I, I went skiing for the first time when I was an adult. I was in my early 40s. I think when you learn skiing when you're younger, it's much easier. And, you know, there I was on a, on a hill with snow and ice on it, with slidey sticks on my feet, you know. And I thought, this is insanity. And gelsemium is very good for that sort of fear of falling. Uh, and I definitely had fear of falling. And they have a situation sometimes where they feel... I sometimes read quite a lot of mountain climbing literature. And what they say, they use the word gripped. Somebody is gripped, gripped by fear. And they think, well, I can't go back down. But I can't go back up, so I'm just going to have to stay here. And they know they can't stay there forever, but they, they literally can't move. Well, I understood that when I went skiing. I'd go across and somebody would, they would say, put in a turn, put in a turn. I'd say, I can't, I can't. I would look down, I thought, I can't face my skis down there. There's no way I can get back up there, and I'm just stuck, and I would just stay there. I don't know why I ever agreed to go again, but I did. I agreed to go skiing because we were going to Whistler in Canada, and I thought, oh, that will be nice. But I took my jet lag combination, which has gelsemium 200 in, and I didn't realise that's what had done it. But I was taking it for the first three days, and in the morning before I went off, I'd have my gelsemium. I felt completely different, completely different. And it was only when I went skiing for the third time, and that was back to, I can't put in a turn again, that I realised what it was that had made the difference. And I took the gelsemium and my skiing came on a ton because it took the fear out. So when we're f afraid of, in a physical ordeal where we have to be brave in a situation, I know it doesn't sound very brave, but it felt brave to me, um, or where there's a physical part to an exam, like a driving test, uh, anything like that, and where we feel shaky and really, really nervous, gelsemium is a, a fantastic remedy. That paralyzed with fear is very, a very strong feature. We mentioned that one of the things we might see sometimes in, in gelsemium is the heavy eyes uh, when they're really afraid. Sometimes that sleepiness is a bit of an escape as well. You know, I'm, I don't want to look at it. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to think about it. I'm going to go to sleep. It's quite a big remedy, gelsemium. It's related to Ignatia, so it has quite a lot of grief in its picture too. But the main thing we're going to use it for is ailments from fear, fright and shock, 
anticipation of an ordeal and being paralysed with fear and not able to move forward after a bad fright. And the last previous useful remedy alert, aconite. We've talked about aconite for croupy coughs, we've talked about it for, for fevers. It's a, it's a very, very useful remedy, but it's also an emotional remedy. And it's another remedy, a bit like arginet, that we can use for panic attacks. But they're not as agitated as the arginet are, they're not so visibly agitated but they will really have a strong fear that they're about to die. When they feel a panic attack, they'll think, oh, I've got tightness in my chest. I'm, I think I'm having a heart attack. And because they're <gasps> hyperventilating, they may go numb. And they'll think, oh, God, it's a stroke. I've, I've got numbness in my hands. I'm having a, I, I, I'm having a stroke. And they'll end up in A&E. And the A&E are very sympathetic, give them a good looking over, and they say, look, you've not had a heart attack. You're not having a stroke. It's a panic attack. So... Aconite can also be a remedy for panic attacks where they feel terror, they feel beside themselves, they don't necessarily show it in quite such a dramatic way, but they're, if they are showing it, they're hyperventilating and they're saying, I think I'm having a heart attack. And if you're their friend or their partner, you might think, you know, they've been under an awful lot of stress recently and something bad had happened. I think this is a stress reaction. And give them a dose of aconite. You can take them to be checked out anyway. But if it's a panic attack, sometimes the aconite, even by the time they've got to the hospital, they'll be, they'll be calmer. So sometimes you can, again, if you want to, if somebody's having a panic attack, you could give them aconite and arsenicum, uh, sorry, aconite and arginate mixed together in a water bottle uh, and have them sip it. The most important thing for a panic attack is to say to people, you're not ill, you're not going mad, you're just having a surge of stress chemicals in your body that are making you feel like this. And if you count your breathing, and take the remedy and talk very soothingly to them and try to get them to count with you, it will be over very fast. Remedies are brilliant for these acute emotional um, complaints. As I say, if these acute remedies aren't sufficient to deal with the situation, uh, there's always the option to see uh, a professional homeopath to get the case taken in depth so that things can be sorted out. But these acute remedies, which are available, they're in first aid kits, they're available to buy over the counter, and they can really, really make a difference uh, to helping someone deal with a, a very unpleasant emotional acute situation. Marcus Fernandez here, CHE founder and principal. I just want to say a big congratulations for finishing the Home Prescriber course. You would have learned so much about homeopathy and how to use it as a home prescriber. And Hilary is such an amazing teacher with such depth of understanding and clinical experience over the past 30 years as a homeopath. Now we have many messages coming in about what the next steps I can take. How can I learn more about homeopathy? Well, we do different courses here at CHE. We do a one year foundation course, which many people do after doing a beginner's course, or you can do one of our practitioner trainings and become a homeopath. So we offer a two year fast track training or a four year part time training all online. So if you wanna press the button below and put an application in, somebody will get back in touch with you and arrange an interview. We're doing an intake now, so don't waste any time. If you feel it in your heart that you want to become a homeopath or you want to further your study of homeopathy, then click on the application below and we look forward to seeing you.